really exciting time for science in the state of Ohio. So with that being said, um, I what, what the format for today is going to be is we're going to have our kickoff from Dr. Mark Peoples, and I'll introduce him in just a second. And then we are going to be going through a series of presentations. We will, after Dr. Peoples um, inspires us for in our science as a career in the times of COVID, we will transition to Mr. Mike Wojtek, and he is the CEO for the Ohio Academy of Science. And he is going to kind of tell everyone what the mission and the goals of the Academy is and where we will be headed in the near future. Then we will be going through a series of presentations. We have three presentations from our high school students, two presentations from our um, pre our college students, and then three presentations from our Ohio professionals and research in their field. So thank you again for joining us this morning. And today um, the, I will be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, let me know. That's how we'll communicate during the question answer time with the presenters. And as always, if you have an opportunity um, to stay muted, that would be great. And um, without further ado, I introduce you to Dr. Mark Peoples. Dr. Peoples is the principal investigator for the Center of Vaccines and Immunity at the Abigail Wexner Research Center. He is a virologist who has been working to understand respiratory syncytial virus, RSV, since his first day of graduate school 46 years ago. RSV is the number one cause of hospitalization each year in children's hospitals. His team and collaborators have spent the past six years developing novel RSV vaccines and testing them in animals. They recently submitted a manuscript describing their first RSV vaccine candidate for publication. When COVID-19 hit, it was natural for him and his collaborators to bring their RSV insights to the development of vaccine candidates for SARS-CoV-2, since both are respiratory viruses with RNA genomes. Mark grew up in North Central Ohio and got his start in research at Heidelberg College in Tiffin after he also participated in Science Day. I, as a mom whose children have had RSV, I am so inspired and wowed by Dr. Peoples. And I'm really excited to present Dr. Peoples to all of you this morning. So without further ado, Mark, I'm going to unmute you and... Well, thank you, Angie, That's a, for the nice introduction. I'm uh, very happy to be here today to, uh, to talk to you. And like Angie said, like many of you, I know I grew up in Ohio uh, and um, I got excited by, by science in general, particularly biology, and I ended up becoming a virologist. And um, I've been doing that for many, many years, 46, you've just heard. Uh, and this year, something new came up and that's uh, COVID-19. And we were just in the right position to be able to do something with that, with some of our collaborators and our technologies. So I wanted to kind of take you through that. And so we'll end up talking about both RSV and about, the, um, about COVID. So I'll also have a couple suggestions along the way for young scientists and how to succeed in a career in science. It's, uh, it really is an exciting career. So let's see, I guess I, so do you see my first slide here? We do, we do. There we go, okay. <laughs> Here's a picture of me. You can guess how old I am by looking at the cake. This was my measles birthday. So when I was six years old, you can kind of see the uh, dark skin. This was before color was invented, so I can't show you in color. But I had a rash on my chest and on my cheeks here. And that was uh, normal for measles virus. Everybody got measles virus when I was a kid. 
What I didn't know here on this day was that actually measles virus had been isolated three years before at Boston Children's Hospital in, uh, in Boston uh, by a guy named Thomas Peebles with a B instead of a P. Uh, he was trying to isolate this virus. It wasn't working out well. His advisor got impatient, said, stop doing that. So Thomas came in at night and continued to work and eventually isolated the virus. Um, went on to win the Nobel Prize for it. And so did his, his advisor. So it was, um, it was a, a big deal. Those were difficult days to be able to isolate viruses. Uh, cell culture was in its infancy. Six years though, after this picture was taken, there was a vaccine. And within a couple of years, the amount of measles virus infections in the country went down precipitously to the point now where most kids are protected um, against measles virus. So it's a, it was a terrific success story, but only nine years between when the virus was first isolated and when we had an effective vaccine. So that's uh, in contrast to respiratory syncytial virus, this, the virus I've studied, uh, that one has been over 60 years and we still don't have a vaccine. So in, um, when I went to Heidelberg College, I'll just take you a little bit through my, my background. Uh, Heidelberg College, I had a chance <clears throat> to work in the, uh, <clears throat> the water quality lab and um, they had a, just a really interesting program. Yeah, so I got to work on the river for two summers. It was actually sponsored a project sponsored by the National Science Foundation at the time. And that's when I, I realized that I like to ask my own questions and work out the answers myself. And um, so that's, um, that kind of got me hooked. It really doesn't go away. Uh, the, the feeling of a discovery, making a discovery, is just uh, one of the best feelings in the world. So one of my professors at Heidelberg knew I liked science, knew I would probably make a good scientist. I wasn't so sure. Uh, but he connected me with my advisor to be at Wayne State University in Detroit. And that's not a big powerhouse school for, for, for science. Um, but the person he introduced me to was, was really interesting. His name was Seymour Levine. And Seymour um, was uh, just starting to work with a new virus called respiratory syncytial virus. He was one of two labs in the world actually working on the proteins of the virus and where they were in the virus particle. So what I, what, what's come to light, I guess, afterwards, many more epidemiologic studies have been done. So we know actually how important it is. It actually puts about 2% of infants in the hospital every year. Um, and around the world, it's the third most common cause of death in the first two years behind birth defects and malaria. So it really does impact the very youngest infants and young children. So at the, uh, at the time, very few people knew about it. Like I say, very few, few were working with it. It just, you know, even within the virology community, people didn't want to work with it because it was so slow growing. It produced low titers of virus. The virus remained stuck on the surface of the cell and it was unstable. So all the wrong things. Most people were working with model viruses instead. So when um, while I was in Seymour's lab, he was able to isolate and purify enough of the virus particle to be able to start looking at the proteins. But one of the experiments I did in the lab was to take that purified virus. This has an envelope here around it that's a, a membrane. Uh, and there are two major proteins on the surface, the attachment protein here called G for glycoprotein and the fusion protein called F for fusion. So what, 
what the attachment protein does is grab onto the receptor on a cell, if the cell expresses a receptor, then the fusion protein causes this membrane of the virus to fuse with the membrane of the cell so that the RNA genome inside here and the proteins associated with it will be spilled into the cytoplasm. And that will then initiate infection. So what I was able to do is take these purified viruses, treat them with trypsin, a protease, and then look at what proteins were left. And the only two proteins that were lost were these two big proteins, the attachment protein and the fusion protein. That's because they were cleaved off the surface. All the rest of the proteins were hidden inside, so they did not, uh, they were not lost. So that's when I started working with these two proteins. And in fact, most of my scientific career, I've been working with these or with a similar, uh, similar proteins and similar viruses. Now to that name, that middle name, syncytia, syncytial is the, in the actual RSV. This is what a syncytia looks like. So here are cells that are infected. You can see individual cells here. Here's one that's infected because it's expressing green. And that's early in infection. Later in infection, uh, it'll express the fusion protein on the surface and then that cell will fuse with a neighboring cell. And so that's why you get these multinucleated cells. Here's four in this one, probably 25 in this one, and close to 50 in this one. So this is the way people first were able to identify this virus from clinical samples. You know, baby had a really bad respiratory infection, couldn't breathe. That's usually what brings the infants to the hospital. They can't breathe. So what it does is when you put it in culture, it'll infect these cells and cause giant cells. And that uh, almost always is, is caused by a respiratory syncytial virus. Uh, these are tumor cells. Okay. Now the virus, why is it turning cells green? Well, that's because I put the green fluorescent protein gene into the virus 25 years ago. Um, and I did that while I was on sabbatical with a friend of mine at NIH who had just invented the system to be able to take this RNA virus, transform its RNA into a full length DNA, clone that into a plasmid, put that into cells like these and get the virus to come back out. That was the first time we had a genetic system. You can't really manipulate RNA, but you can manipulate DNA with uh, restriction enzymes and PCR, things like that. So we were able then to add an extra gene to this virus so that when it, when it replicates in, in a cell, it expresses GFP and you can see what cells are infected. So I've, I've been able to send this virus to over a hundred labs around the world over the years so that they can also study the virus. That's another point, actually. Uh, sabbaticals are good things. That's what I did 25 years ago, and it really changed the kinds of things that I could do. First thing is to identify what you need to do. The second thing is to go out and get the information and the skills to do it. But those were tumor cells, and for many decades, that's all we used to study RSV were tumor cells. But we really know those aren't the cells that get infected in the body. The cells in the nose, in the airways, <clears throat> the bronchioles, the bronchi and the bronchioles are all ciliated epithelium. <clears throat> so here's a picture of a cross section from a trachea. Um, and you can see sort of basement membrane down here. And these, most of these cells are columnar cells. They're tall and narrow. And then you have some progenitor cells here on the bottom, kind of stem cells. But what you see at the top is this fringe. These are cilia. Many of these cells are ciliated and the cilia are moving. Other cells produce mucus. These uh, kind of lighter cells produce mucus and secrete it. That's why your whole respiratory tract is covered with mucus. 
and these cilia are pushing the mucus constantly upward and out. So any bacteria or viruses that get trapped in it can be disposed of. So we wanted to use cells like this to study the virus. So we learned of some people at University of North Carolina who were doing just that. They were able to take the bronchi trachea from an organ donor and isolate these progenitor cells, grow them in culture, and then differentiate them in culture. That whole process takes five weeks. It's a lot of time, but the investment's well worth it. The cells grow on a, on a filter here that have pores, little holes punched in them, so that the medium can come up from the bottom, and they're exposed to air at the top, just like your airways are. Now, when we infect these cells with RSV that's expressing GFP, you can see the cells that are infected because they're very bright green. Uh, and one of the things you see is that all the red, which is staining cilia, it's only the infected, the only cells that are infected are the ones that are ciliated. So this is when we learn that the ciliated cells, not the goblet cells or the other cells in the airways, are actually the ones infected by RSV. And we did this in 2002, so 18 years ago. Uh, since then, we've go on, gone on to actually identify the receptor on these cells that lets the virus in. But the last point here is simply, you don't see any syncytia here. These cells are not fusing the way the tumor cells did in culture. So even though that was important for diagnostic purposes, it's not what happens in vivo. So actually that middle name that's so disruptive that most people can't pronounce um, and stops most conversations is, uh, is actually a misnomer. So it, uh, it was a mistake, mistakes happen, right? So once we had these cells, uh, we've done all kinds of things with them. But one of the most gratifying was the one I'll tell you about now, uh, a, a collaboration with a group of investigators that are, that are just terrific. Uh, these two investigators here with me work at Nationwide Children's Hospital where our research institute is. Uh, Octavio Romillo is actually the head of infectious diseases. And they came here to Nationwide Children's uh, with an interest and passion in studying respiratory syncytial virus. But from the other side, they see the babies that come into the hospital. They wanna know why some are extremely sick and why others aren't. Uh, what, is a, what is it about the response or about the virus that causes this difference? And they also wanna make a vaccine. So we had that in common but it's a big project and uh, one individual just can't, can't do this kind of thing. So actually for all of my career up till about the last 10 years, I've essentially worked for myself. I've of course learned things from lots of other people, but I've been responsible for myself, my lab, period, no collaborators. But I broke that habit in the last 10 years. I'm very glad that I did. Uh, we work together very well. Their lab is right next to mine, and their office is just down the hall, so they can't escape me. In addition to our group here at, at Nationwide Children's, we have a group over at the vet school at Ohio State. And um, Stefan Nevis here is a, is a world expert in a small animal model called the cotton rat, which is much better than mice for studying RSV. So we use his expertise there. Uh, Jen Rong Lee is, is a vaccine magnet. Uh, anytime there's a need for a vaccine, he is making it. He is just tremendously productive uh, and uh, just a great collaborator. And Mike Tang at the University of South Florida. So we have a, a place to hold our winter meetings. Uh, but actually the three of us work with different genes. So I told you I work with the glycoprotein genes. Jen Ron works with the polymerase gene 
which takes up almost half of the virus. And Mike Tang works with a non-structural gene that dampens the interferon response so the virus can replicate. So this has been a, just a, a terrific interaction that we've had um, for these about seven years. We've discovered some things that the, the people that are, have been working on making a live attenuated vaccine have not done, uh, and we've been able to do them, and I think have uh, some great candidates now, and in the near future, we'll have even more. That's been a, a great, great uh, collaboration. So let me just show you here, the, these are the HBE cultures, the human airway bronchial cultures, but now we're looking at them in a different way. We're looking directly down on them. And here, it's a much lower magnification than you saw in that cross section. But what you see are these little green dots, looks kind of like stars in the sky. Those are those columnar cells, and we're just looking right at the top because we're looking down on them. So those are the GFP expressing cells. Now this is day one. Now look what happens by day two. There's this hurricane that forms, kind of like in North Carolina where the virus comes out of one cell and these cilia are pushing it around the dish. And the cilia and the whole well are coordinated in some way. I don't know how it's done, but they're pushing the mucus around the dish. And this is probably akin to what they would be doing in pushing the mucus out of your respiratory tract to get rid of the bacteria or viruses that are trapped in it. So this happens and just in two days, you get a spread of from very few infected cells to a huge number. And by day three, nearly all the cells that can be infected are infected. So we can use this system then to study attenuation. So we're looking at uh, these mutations that we make that attenuate, that means weaken the virus. And we can put them in these cultures and see how quickly they spread. That's a measure of how much virus they produce uh, and uh, therefore how mild the, the infection will be in a person. Because with, an, with a virus, attenuated virus, you don't want the disease to be spread, you just want the protection. So you're trying to find that middle point between infection and uh, immunity that gives you no disease but good immunity. So COVID came along, uh, you may have noticed that in the last couple months, really changed our lives. <clears throat> so here's a picture from the CDC of the virus. So SARS-CoV-2 is a virus that uh, has some similarities to RSV. It has an, <clears throat> has an RNA genome. Um, it's got an envelope and it's a respiratory virus. So many of the same things that we're used to studying all the time are here. So this, this is the spike protein that you hear about all the time. This is really, this is the protein that does both jobs that the G and the F protein do for RSV. It's both the attachment protein and it's the fusion protein. It's also a much bigger protein, it's about twice the size of uh, either of our proteins. So that's what um, then starts the whole process. The attachment site is right here. One of these little elbows flips up and at the top of it, that's where it attaches. And that starts the whole process. So when, when COVID-19 came along, uh, we were just right in the right place. We have my clinical colleagues who are interested in looking at infants and children and the effects of COVID on them. And, um, and my collaborator who makes vaccines all the time, he has started to make vaccines here. He's already got 10 different ones. He's working on an 11th now. We've got it in mice and we have antibody uh, studies so we're, we're moving forward. We're making actually the glycoprotein modifications on this S protein with uh, concepts that have worked with other viruses that may make it more immunogenic. 
it's antibodies against this this big protein that actually neutralizes the virus. So we want to be able to express that in a vaccine in a way that uh, induces a, a good immune response. So here's just one experiment. Now we, when you work with um, SARS-CoV-2, it's got to be done in a BSL-3 lab. And um, that's a high containment lab. It's not the highest. The highest is four. And our lab here is a two. That's the general uh, lab for working with viruses. But we just got approval last uh, week to work in the BSL-3 lab. And um, probably within the next week or two, we'll be in there. This is an experiment that was done by one of my colleagues at Ohio State. And if you just look at the upper right-hand corner here, just for a minute, here, this is a neutralization assay. It's using very old technique, technique that I used when I was in graduate school of a plaque assay. And what you see are these holes in this monolayer of cells. The cells have been stained with a dye. But these round holes are where a virus bound to a cell infected it, spread to the neighboring cells and the neighboring cells, and killed the whole area. So by counting these, we know how much virus was in the original inoculum. So here it's being used, though, to look for neutralizing antibodies. The antibodies are diluted here. And so what you see when you add those diluted sera to the virus, in this person, there was no neutralization. You have the same number of uh, virus plaques here as you have here. So, so this was serum that came from people who were convalescent. So convalescent means about, we're looking for three to four weeks after the acute infection. That's when the antibodies are the highest. And the point of this experiment was not just an experiment, at Ohio State, they were looking for serum from these people that had high titered antibodies. And they would collect that serum and put it in to people who were having a hard time with uh, COVID-19. And those antibodies then could stop the virus infection and perhaps make the person uh, recover more quickly. This serum didn't work. There wasn't enough antibody. But this one did. So you could see you could dilute this way out to 1 to 320 and still have a lot of neutralizing effect. And this third serum was also that way. So some of these sera end up, ended up being useful in patients. So just in, in ending, I would make some suggestions for future scientists. One is <clears throat> read constantly, always be reading. And what I mean by that is to, to make it a routine. Every, every day, take an hour and read the literature. You want to know what's going on in your field. You want to know what's going on in science in general. So you want to be looking at the journals that are specific to your discipline, but also science and nature and cell and some of those really big journals uh, that'll tell you sort of where science is going. Second is to participate. Go to meetings. Go to talks. And when you do, sit near the front. You can, you're more engaged when you're up in the front. And be thinking about questions. Ask questions. And if you don't ask questions during the seminar or after it, remember your question because when everybody goes to lunch, you may be standing in line right next to the speaker. And if you have a question, you can start a conversation. And it's just a terrific thing to do. I've, I've done that all my life and you wouldn't believe how many times I've been in the cafeteria line with a speaker that I wanted to talk to and I was ready. Also join societies. Join the society in your discipline, the Ohio Academy of Science, you're probably, many of you are all already members. For me, American Society for Virology is the other. But then also join a society that's broader than that, like AAAS, American Association for the Advancement of Science. 
they actually speak out for science. They help bring science to national policy. Uh, and and we, we need that. Also, join Sigma Xi. Some of you may have a chapter of Sigma Xi on your college campus. It's a scientific research. It is the scientific research honorary society. But it can give you a chance to connect to, to the public, to students and to older people. We need to be out there talking about our science, why we enjoy it, what it means, and why it's important. So um, wherever you can do that, and if you have a grant from the National Science Foundation, they actually require you to go out and present your work uh, to the public. And you gotta learn how to do that. It's gotta be in a way that's not showing all the data, maybe showing some colorful pictures, but uh, with analogies, that kind of thing. So I've been a member of Sigma Xi since I was uh, in grad school and a member of uh, AAAS since I started as a faculty member. It's actually very cheap and you get Science Magazine every week. It's, it's just amazing. You can follow so much of what's going on in politics and funding and in your area and in the hot areas. So I'll end there. I'm looking forward to a great time today listening to the rest of your talks. And I appreciate you listening to me. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Peebles, so much. Um, I can tell you as an educator for high school biology, I cannot wait to show your presentation to my students because there is so much that you talked about this morning that's part of the curriculum for Ohio Science. And there are many times where I struggle to explain um, exactly what that, that topic is like GFP and because it's very difficult for them to visualize it. And I'm really excited to show your example. I think it will help to visualize because usually the only thing I can come up with is a glowfish from the pet store. So <laughs> this is um, an actual real data that's been collected. And again, as a mom whose son had RSV at three weeks old and we thought we were going to lose him, um, I greatly appreciate your work and I know um, actually, while you were presenting, I had a couple of my friends who are actually on this presentation text me the same thing, that they really appreciate it because their own children had RSV when they were young. So um, we just really appreciate your uh, things I heard from your presentation, your collaboration with scientists from all over the United States, um, the advancement, the, the pushing for advancement in the state of Ohio um, is just amazing. So thank you again for your presentation this morning. We really appreciate it. If anyone has a question for Dr. Peebles, if you would like to put it in the chat, that would be great. I know um, we had a question. It said, the, is the dilution of the serum or the virus? Oh yeah, that's a dilution of the serum. Okay. You put the, you put the same amount of virus in each one. If you look here at the uh, controls, you see they're all the same. Um, so yeah, it's a dilution of the serum. So it's looking for how much antibody, neutralizing antibody you have in the serum. Right. This is just fascinating. And again, in a time where educators, we're gonna try to teach our students um, applicable and real world science, potentially from a virtual platform, I'm really going to appreciate <laughs> your your uh, visualizations there are really going to be helpful. So thank you again so much for sharing this morning. We appreciate you. Sure. So we are going to transition now. Um, and I, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Mike Wojtek. He is going to do is give you an overview of the Ohio Academy of Science and talk about um, what the Ohio Academy of Science's vision and mission and goals are for the Academy. And I need to unmute. And Mike, you should be unmuted. And I'm going to hand it over to you, sir. Thank you, Angie. Um... And Mark, thank you so much. It's uh, it's an it's an honor for you to be able to join us, um, the State Science Day alumnus, 
um, a respected world um, world renowned scientist. Um, thank you for for joining us, and again, uh, and for being such a good friend uh, to the Ohio Academy of Science. Um, I've changed my presentation around several times. Um, I wanted to give an update and um, kind of a um, state of the academy, but I realized we had such a broad audience today, uh, many stakeholders that weren't members, perhaps they're volunteers. Um, we definitely spread the word around to, uh, to celebrate today's, uh, uh, today's uh, seminar. And I thought I'd, I'd start with going over um, kind of what, what the academy is, um, not just what happens or what people think happened behind the curtain, but it was founded in 1891. We are a membership-based, volunteer-driven, not-for-profit organization. We have an excess of 800 members and we have thousands, literally thousands of volunteers that help us um, execute our programs and bring science to a, uh, to a broad constituency. When we talk about um, membership, to be a member in the academy, it's, it's individual members. However, we have many institutions that do sponsor memberships for individual members. And this is a, um, a snapshot of all of those institutions. Um, as you can see, we do have um, colleges, universities represented, and our sponsors, our title sponsors, who also received an in-kind institutional membership in the academy. Um, this is important because as an institutional member, um, they're able to sponsor for their employees, faculty, staff, and students to become an individual member in the OAS. Um, we do have different levels of membership. If you do not um, belong or not affiliated with an institutional member, um, you could join under a wide variety of, of classifications of membership. Um, and why members are important to the OAS, um, we are, our members are like shareholders to a corporation. Well, no one person or entity can actually own the OAS or any 501c3 for that matter. Rather, it is a membership controlled organization. Um, and our members select a governing body, which is our board of trustees. Our board of trustees are, um, they are responsible for managing and governing the academy. And if you're interested in membership, I've certainly, there's my number, uh, and there's also a membership link from our website as well. And I will also post this, um, this uh, PowerPoint so people um, can access or uh, have links directly to it. Our board of trustees, we are led by um, Rodney Sheets. Uh, he's with the uh, uh, United States Geological Survey and um, the, the other members of our, of our um, board. We do have some, um, some new members. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce or, or call attention to Dr. Christina. Uh, Fussell of the Ohio Sea Grant College Program at Stone Labs, um, Erica Montbach, who it says Kent Displays, I uploaded this yesterday, and I should have uh, adjusted that. She has now joined uh, NASA. Um, it's a very exciting thing for Dr. Montbach and also for the Academy. Uh, Donner, Dr. Mina Macri uh, is with OSUMC, but he is uh, joined under an industry at large with a company that he founded, Core Access, and Ms. Hallie Miller is an environmental scientist with Manic and Smith Group. Um, those are our new board members that joined in uh, 2020. Our mission and vision is to uh, foster curiosity, discovery, and innovation and problem solving skills in Ohio. And our vision is to be the leading organization to advance the understanding and practice of science, engineering, and technology. Um, as objectives, we encourage and assure the discovery and understanding, the dissemination of practice of education, science, mathematics, engineering, technology, and their applications. And this is important because um, really it is the board's responsibility to set the strategic goals, um, the missions, the, the visions, the objectives of the academy. And um, 
really for, for us to develop opportunities to deliver that. And we do so in the form of our programs and our interactivities. Um, the Ohio Journal of Science in, in our annual meeting are two such examples of that. Uh, the journal is a multidisciplinary publication that has been in, uh, that has been in publication since 1990. Um, it is published open access online uh, by the Ohio State University Libraries. Um, our manuscripts have had, um, since 2015, have had 61,000 plus online views. Um, and I would tell our, for any scientist who, um, especially if Ohio is a part of that subject matter, to really strongly, um, I would recommend them um, submitting and considering the journal for submission. Is for our, our young researchers, if it is their first time um, in publication or considering publication, I would tell you this, that uh, Dr. Len Elfner, who is the CEO Emeritus of the Academy and our editor of the journal does an incredible job um, it is a very, um, a very hands-on approach. We have many researchers that, that, are, that are so complementary in, um, in terms of the, the end product, the manuscript itself, and how much better it was through the peer review process in our ability to enhance that manuscript. Um, again, for young researchers uh, in, in, in first publication, I can't encourage you enough to uh, to reach out to Dr. Elfner and there is his contact information. Um, our annual meeting, which will be held uh, in at Edison State Community College, I would like to thank Cleveland State for the opportunity to, to host our meeting in 2020, which unfortunately we were unable to gather in person. Um, but it is a multidisciplinary meeting. Uh, we encourage and invite all of the sciences and it is a representation of academia, industry, and government. Um, we do publish the abstracts. We use the Ohio Journal of Science to do so. Um, we will be, I can't even believe it's August, but September, we will be already um, reaching out to our membership and to stakeholders throughout Ohio, um, encouraging submissions for abstracts for uh, and during the review process. So please keep checking your inboxes for that. A view of our annual meeting. Um, this one happened to be at Bowling Green State University. Um, and again, these are our programs that um, serve to fulfill um, the mission, the vision, and the objectives. And our junior academy is, is there to foster the ability and the dis discovery of science and mathematics for grades five through 12. And we do this in our programs um, through District Science Day, State Science Day, Buckeye Science and Engineering Fair. Um, the annual meeting itself gives opportunities for um, young presenters to submit a, a Melvin report. And we consider those um, reports to uh, provide an opportunity for the students to move on to AJAS and to present uh, in, in conjunction or with the AAAS conference that's held annually. Um, Believe in Ohio is a program that was reestablished at the Academy. We received an appropriation through the Ohio General Assembly. It's um, placed under the, um, uh, under the budget of, of the Department of Higher Education, and it combines STEM and entrepreneurship in a way to, um, to encourage students to consider commercializing their ideas and bringing to market um, either through a commercialization plan or a business plan competing on that basis for scholarships, prizes, and awards. Um, again, uh, State Science Day starts where every student in Ohio has an opportunity to participate. Um, we have 17 district partners throughout the state. This is how students get to State Science Day, um, the Buckeye Science and Engineering Fair. Um, and from there, uh, a lot of projects are developed and brought to our annual meeting. I had to show this shot. Uh, this is the 
This is the granddaddy of them all um, from the catwalk at, uh, at the French Field House at the Ohio State University. Um, we hope to engage with Ohio State and create a, a vision of 2.0 for Science Day. Um, is an update, uh, I'm, I will tell you that we will not have an in-person event at Ohio State in 2021, but we have plans underway to um, reinvigorate uh, that relationship and, and with a look to 2022 and beyond. Um, for those of you that are interested in supporting State Science Day, um, whether you'd like to be a judge um, or provide organizational support um, through sponsorship or by providing an award, um, please email me or I would encourage you to uh, reach out to have a discussion. Um, beyond State Science Day, uh, the Buckeye Science and Engineering Fair, it's Ohio's uh, ISAF affiliated state fair um, and Every student that goes to a district science day is eligible. Um, I would also, uh, the Buckeye Science and Engineering Fair selects more finalists than any other fair, affiliated fair in Ohio to move on to the international. In the, uh, for the sake of time, and so that we could get to the most important part of our our meeting, uh, our presenters themselves. Um, I would be happy to take any questions if there are none. Angie, we could kind of move on. I don't know what you have in the chat. Not seeing anything in the chat right now, but I will continue to monitor it. And they have your contact information and we can make sure that um, if anybody has any additional questions, I'll continue to monitor that. So without further ado, um, to give you an idea of the rest of the timeline for our celebration, we are going to begin with our pre-college presenters. And our first college presenter, if uh, Caroline, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen and get set up. Our first college presenter is Caroline Zhang. She is from Hathaway Brown High School. And her presentation is on drug discovery for osteoporosis and endoplasmic reticulum, also known as ER, stress and Alzheimer's disease mice. And don't forget that after the presenters there have their presentation, it's about uh, 10 to 15 minutes in length, we'll have about five minutes for question answer. So again, please use the chat feature for um, if you have any questions for our presenters. So without further ado, Caroline, let me get in here and make sure that you are unmuted. Just a quick second. I know I was trying to mute everyone on entry and I apologize. Oh, I think I'm unmuted. Okay, perfect. All right, Caroline, without further ado, you have the floor. Thank you. I really enjoyed this webinar so far. So my name is Caroline Jung. I'm a rising senior at Hathaway Brown, and I work under Dr. Jung's lab at Case Western Reserve University. So as um, you said earlier, my project is titled Drug Discovery for Osteoporosis and Endoplasmic Reticulum Stress in Alzheimer's Disease Model Mice. So just for background, Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, and it is caused when there's a lot of interruptions in the connective behaviors of the brain and um, neuronal damage. So this is shown when the brain shrinks in size and will lose neurons more than normal. So depending on the severity, it can degrade daily life, but it is an age-related pathology. So Although it is normal to lose neurons as people age, it um, Alzheimer's disease becomes more um, prevalent and more of a problem when it does degrade th daily life to um, that extent. So as you can see in the picture below, it worsens over time and it, it becomes more widespread. So osteoporosis 
is set is a little bit separate. It is a bone disease. Um, it's characterized when there's a lot of weak bones and brittle bones, and there's a low bone density, as shown in the picture. However, um, my lab previously published a um, publication where they found that there was a correlation between Alzheimer's and osteoporosis. So for a quick summary, they found that there was a lower bone density in Alzheimer's mice um, in the same age group. So this is interesting to point out because both Alzheimer's and osteoporosis are age related. So this kind of brings us to the question of how does Alzheimer's and osteoporosis also have an effect on bone homeostasis, which I'll answer later. The second part of my project focuses on endoplasmic reticulum or ER stress. So this has happened when there's a lot of aggregation of misfolded proteins in the endoplasmic reticulum, which is responsible for a lot of cellular functions. So to the previous question of Alzheimer's, osteoporosis, and bone homeostasis, um, it's important to see that bone homeostasis is really dependent on the balance um, between osteoblasts and osteoclasts. So osteoblasts are bone formation cells, and these are the cells that we will look further in depth um, later, and then osteoclasts are bone absorption cells. So when we say there is an osteoblast differentiation, it just means that a cell that doesn't have the characters of an osteoblast will differentiate into an osteoblast. So for example, um, in my uh, research, it was bone marrow stromal cells differentiating into osteoblasts. However, this, become, this can become a problem when there's a deficit, when um, there are less cells differentiating into osteoblasts. And um, when there is a deficit, it tends to have a lower bone density, which is what um, they will also be focusing on. So in relation to osteoblasts and low bone density, it's also important to bring up senescent cells. So these cells lose the ability to divide and it happens when it undergoes cell cycle arrest. So these senescent cells also have shown that they have less osteoblasts and therefore less bone formation cells, which would result in less bone density, which is also a symptom of osteoporosis. So there is a possible correlation with osteoporosis here, but we do know for sure that they both exhibit low bone density. So these senescent cells um, are secret, um, what is called SESPs, or senescent associated secretory phenotype. And these are very harmful to the body. So when we want to combat against senescent cells, we should be, we use, um, we uh, were using inhibitors that would also combat SESPs as well. So we, I used two methods in my research, but they all started out the same way in the first four steps. So first, um, my mentor sacrificed the wall type in um, experimental APP mice. So the wall type is the control mice, and then the APP is the Swedish mutant amyloid precursor protein. This is the experimental Alzheimer's mice is the most common. And we picked this because the beta amyloid plaques in the APP is one of the major causes of Alzheimer's. Um, after that, we um, isolated the bone marrow stromal cells and then cultured the cells with basal medium just until substantial growth, which then we were able to pretreat them with um, three drugs. So we left, we separated these cells into four groups. So we left one untreated acting as a control, one for 4PBA. And so this would help relieve against ER stress. It regulates what is called GRP78. Um, that I will get into a little bit later, but basically the, G the more GRP78 there is, the more ER stress there is. The next, another group was treated with metformin and another one was treated with ophromycin. So these are both two examples of SASP inhibitors, which are um, secreted by senescent cells. So we hope that these two drugs would um, combat against senescence. 
So after those four steps, we moved on to our first methods. So this was osteoplast differentiation. So after treating them with the drugs, we treated the, the bone marrow stroma cells with an osteoplast medium so they could differentiate into osteoplasts. And then after that, we stained them for with alkaline phosphatase to visualize how much osteoplast plus growth there actually was. So in the picture below, you can kind of see the four groups that we divided them up with. So we had one for one group for each um, pre -tre treatment of a drug. Our next method was with a Western blot. So we first isolated the protein um, and then did the Western blot to for expression, then used antibodies to detect these. So we used three. One was GRP78, which is an ER stress marker, P16, which is a senes cell marker, and then B-actin just acted as the loading control to make sure we loaded the same amount of protein into each wall. So for osteoblast differentiation, we first started off with the wall-type control mice. And so we found that um, for the cells that were pretreated with 4-PPA, metformin, and rapamycin, there was an increase in osteoblast growth than the control. So the dark purple area, areas show osteoblast growth, and the percentage underneath them um, show the ALP activity. So we defined ALP activity as the percentage of osteoblasts over the entire area of the plate. So you can see here, um, qualitatively and quantitatively, there was an increase in osteoblasts for the cells that were pretreated. We did the same experiment again with both wall type control mice and the experimental APP mice. So um, for this one, uh, part A is just in a higher magnification, but we also did a quantitative analysis on part B. And so we saw that this in this experiment too, there was an increase of osteoblast growth or ALP activity in cells that were treated with 4-PPA, metformin, and rabomycin than the control. So the dark, um, the black bar shows wild type mice and the gray bar shows the experimental AD mice. This is our, from our second method, so, so the Western blot. And so for this one, we were looking at CRP78 and P16, which are the ER stress and senescent cell markers. And we can see here that for the cells that were treated with rapamycin and 4-PPA, there was a decrease um, with lighter bands for um, both. So GRP78, as I said earlier, is ER stress marker and P16 is senescence. Um, so we saw there was a decrease in these. However, an important and interesting to point out is metformin. So it seems that there was little to no effect. Um, so in the future, we will continue to do this. However, this is just for wall type um, control mice. And we did this first just to get a general understanding or a general pattern to what we might see if we did both wall type and the APP. So from our results, we found that an increase in osteoplasts would yield more formation that may have been caused from a decrease in senescence from the pretreatment of these three drugs. We saw there was a decrease in GRP78 and P16 in the Western blot. So we showed there was a decrease in um, senescence and ER stress when we used um, 4-PPA and rapamycin as the two pretreatment drugs. So as a general whole, there's a possible positive yield toward the usage of 4-PPA and rapamycin and may be useful for um, Alzheimer's patients who experience low bone density. Um, we will continue to look at metformin just because it seems to be a little more complicated because it was effective in the osteoblast differentiation but not the Western blot. And then, so in the future, we will continue to do these um, experiments for the wall type and the APP. Um, and then through that, we will determine which drug is the most effective while also um, being very focused on what, how um, metformin also responds. So 
thank you so much. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Caroline. Does anyone have any questions for Caroline? If you wanted to put them in the chat, we can look at those. Caroline, are you going to continue your you're going to continue your research this year? Well, oh, well, I mean, in a normal summer and a normal school year, <laughs> I'm going back to lab. So, I mean, it kind of depends on how the situation with COVID um, goes throughout the year. So, if it becomes safer to do so, then hopefully I will be able to. But for the time being, it seems that I won't be able to go back for a while. Okay. And I think that's a challenge that so many researchers are having with how to get, have safe interactions in the lab. So does anyone have any questions for Caroline? Oh, I see a couple. Has all of your experimentation been done in cell culture? Yes, other than the Western, yeah, the, after the cell culture, we would sometimes for the Western plot, just after that, we isolate the protein, then it was out of cell culture, but yes. Okay. Well, Caroline, I can tell you on behalf of the Ohio Academy of Science, you represent the future, and we are so thrilled that you have presented today. Um, and given us your overall of your research. Oh, one more question. What was the most challenging aspect of your work? Um, for me, I've never done like re research before this. So for me, it was kind of getting used to um, kind of like the rhythm of what research and what my mentors were doing and okay. kind of becoming used to all of the terminology used and searching it up and finding correlations of what I could do. So anything that didn't go the way that you thought it would, that you had to challenge yourself through? Yeah. <laughs> some, <laughs> I mean, some experiments, like at first, there were many failures before, so. Well, that's how we find our discoveries, right? Through our failures. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Caroline. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, next on our agenda today is Michelle Park, and Michelle is from Solon High School, and her presentation is analyzing the effect of um, iron hydrogen values on the absolute magnitude and non-Blasco RR R Rabe Lear light curves. And Michelle and I practiced me saying the title of her presentation the other day, and I'm sure I, I butchered it again, Michelle. I apologize. Um, so your work, it sounds absolutely amazing. So Michelle, whenever you are ready, um, we'll go ahead and switch over to your presentation. Hello, my name is Michelle Park and I am a junior at Solon High School. So today I'll be talking about my research project titled Analyzing the Effect of Iron to Hydrogen Ratio Values on the Absolute Magnitude in Non-Blasco RRAB Lyrae Light Curves. So variable stars are defined as stars that fluctuate in brightness by a factor of 20% to 500% over periods of time. They are important in astronomy as you can utilize them to find distances to the interstellar objects that they reside in. So in this project, I analyzed our Lyrae's, a specific type of variable star known for their short periods lasting from hours to days. The variability of these RR Lyrae's is unfortunately not well understood, especially their connection to their composition. So by understanding this connection further, RR Lyrae's can more accurately achieve their purpose of measuring distances to interstellar objects. The hydrogen to hydrogen, iron to hydrogen ratio values were used as a metric 
to numericize metallicity, which is defined as the amount of elements that aren't hydrogen and helium within a star. I decided to look at non-BLASCO RRAB Lyrae specifically as RR Lyrae that were non-BLASCO and were in the RRAB subtype would refine my analysis. Non-BLASCO RR Lyrae are known for not exhibiting the BLASCO effect, which means that alongside their base variability, they will not have additional long-term modulations in brightness that may vary their average magnitude across months or years. For my research, this was crucial so that I could more consistently measure the base variability of the RR Lyrae. RRAB Lyrae are the most common subtype of RR Lyrae and have the most consistent variability compared to their RRB and RRC counterparts. So both of these characteristics were needed in order to solidify the relationship between an RR Lyrae's metallicity and its light curve. For this study, I utilized a wide variety of tools to produce accurate data and carry out my analysis. The first tool I used was the SLU Canary 2 telescope located in the Canary Islands to take my 135 images of the 15 RR Lyrae's in the study. These RR Lyrae's were identified as being in the non glasco and RRAB subtypes by Namek et al. in 2011. Every day I made nine reservations starting at 5.30 p.m. in one hour increments to 1.30 a.m. for the target RR Lyrae. And since the telescope is remotely accessible, I was able to automatically take the photos I needed. After gathering all the necessary photos, I accessed the SIMBAD database, which stands for the set of identifications, measurements, and bibliography for astronomical, astronomical data. Using this data, I found the name and apparent magnitude of the locator stars for each of the RR Lyrae's. These locator stars are crucial to finding the brightness of the target RR Lyrae's in my photos. Another tool I used was Astro Image J, a software produced by the University of Louisville to analyze the images of the RR Lyrae's and find their apparent magnitudes, which is their brightness seen from Earth, by comparing them to their respective locator stars. VSTAR, a software from the American Association of Variable Star Observers, was used to plot the data points to produce clean and organized light curve graphs like the one shown on the slide. After the procedure was completed, the following figures were produced. Here are some of the photos that I took using the SLU telescope. Then I analyzed these photos and produced the table on the left, which shows all the absolute magnitude values I collected which is the brightness of the star hypothetically seen at a distance of 10 parsecs. Since stars that look further away look dimmer, I use, since stars that are further away look dimmer, I used absolute magnitude to keep the theoretical distance of the star as a controlled variable. After that, I produced 15 light curves of the target RR Lyrae using V-star as displayed in the figure on the right. These are the final graphs produced. First, I'll talk about the graph on the left. The graph reveals the negative exponential relationship between an RR Lyrae's metallicity and their light curve's amplitude. The rationale for this relationship is that RR Lyrae's with the higher metallicity have correspondingly less fusing elements that provide energy since that space is taken up by non-hydrogen, non-helium elements. With less energy, these variable stars cannot fluctuate as dramatically, thus resulting in the smaller amplitudes as seen in the graphs. The graph on the right reveals another crucial relationship, the correlation between an RR Lyrae's metallicity and its period. This negative linear relationship is explained by atomic diffusion, a natural process in star atmospheres that results in mass loss. 
in variable stars, especially our early rays, having a higher metallicity and thus less fusing elements like hydrogen and helium results in less mass loss because they are affected less by the process of atomic diffusion that can elongate the RR Lyrae's period. Overall, my research proves how there is a relationship between an RR Lyrae's composition and the characteristics of its light curve. With this information in hand, I hope that RR Lyrae's and perhaps other variable stars can be used more extensively and with greater accuracy in the future when measuring the distances to interstellar objects. For my acknowledgments, I'm extremely grateful to Professor Dustin Schroeder, the Assistant Professor of Geophysics at Stanford University for his valuable insight and guidance throughout my project. I'd also like to recognize the SLU organization providing me the remote access telescopes that I used in this study. Thank you for listening to my presentation. I would be happy to answer any questions. Michelle, that was amazing. I know that I had one question and it might be something that you and Caroline um, could or could answer, but um, some people have asked about how did you um, get a chance to connect with the research scientists from the labs that were have been your mentors and what advice would you give to young students who want to do further research in a higher advanced lab, how would they go about doing that? Um, first off, uh, I met my mentor, Professor Justin Schroeder, um, during the Science Olympia National Tournament back in eighth grade. And there I actually got his business card. And later when I was starting to brainstorm my research, I decided to contact him for some valuable insight and he was incredibly helpful. And he really provided me the advice to push my project forward and allow me to become more successful. So my situation was a little bit different. So at my school, we have a program that's called Science um, Research and Engineering Program. So it helps us to connect with um, researchers who are willing to take in high school students. So basically, and a lot of our students uh, go to Case Western Reserve. And so I searched up on Case websites, like searched up all the PIs and what their labs were doing. And I picked out a few like labs that I thought would be really um, interesting to be working at. And so my teacher helped me connect with them and eventually got a placement. So two different ways of connecting with some potential mentor scientists, which is very exciting. So thank you both for that. I have a question in the chat for you. Michelle says, um, what drew you to this area of research? What, what is the fascination? What's your inspiration? Um, in fifth grade, I became really interested in astrophysics after my science teacher showed me some really cool Neil deGrasse Tyson books. And since then, I've always wanted to go into individual research, finding new discoveries within this field, and being able to do so by studying variable stars was incredibly important to me since the year prior, I actually visited a camp to study variable stars, and that really got me interested in how they work and what relationships could drive us to use these as more accurate tools to measure distances. I have another question in the chat. It says, what's, what's next for you in science? Are you going to continue this project? What do you think your future holds? Um, I hope to continue and develop this project even further, maybe create some, find some new correlations to utilize are our theories as better tools, or maybe even extending it to more variable star types. Um, right now, I'm working on an exoplanet project, which I hope will be finished within this year. And I think that would be really nice to share. Absolutely amazing. Michelle, thank you so much for sharing your presentation and your expertise. This, it was fascinating. I, it's just awesome. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> and I'm not even your teacher. So to wrap up our pre-college uh, presentations this morning, 
We have Hamani Patterson, and Hamani is from Dublin Kaufman High School. And her presentation is the effect of turmeric on E. coli growth in a bacterial cytal and bacteriostatic mechanism. So without further ado, we're gonna switch over. Okay, thank you so much for the opportunity to present my research today. Um, I'm Himani and I will be a rising senior at Dublin Kaufman High School. Um, and so for the past two years, um, I spent my time researching, um, simulating the effect of turmeric on the growth of E. coli in bacteriostatic and bactericidal mechanisms. So at the time when I got really interested in this research, um, it was a common theme in the news to hear about outbreaks where um, people would get sick from consuming, from consuming contaminated um, lettuce that had E. coli in it. And so doctors were actually um, not prescribing antibiotics to treat those infections um, because they could have further complications. And so I wanted to find a solution to this problem um, without exacerbating the antibiotic resistance crisis. So I wanted to look into using natural antibiotics to see if um, they would be effective to both cure those symptoms, but also to see if they could be used to prevent the E. coli from contaminating the lettuce in the first place. So um, the natural antibiotic that I chose to research was turmeric. Um, and my initial research question was looking at how effective turmeric was at both curing and preventing the growth of E. coli. And then eventually I modified that research question to um, see if prevention or through a bacteriostatic mechanism is more effective than curing through a bactericidal mechanism. So um, just for some background, 42% of E. coli infections are caused by E. coli contaminating um, leafy produce such as lettuce or spinach. And how the E. coli actually can contaminate the um, produce is because in places like um, California and Arizona where lettuce farms are typically, um, there are also cattle ranches that are right next to them. And so inside cattle's small intestines, they actually have E. coli to help them digest the food that they eat. And so um, cattle feces also has that E. coli in it. And that feces can run off into the common water supply, which is then used to um, water the crops. So that's kind of how the E. coli contaminates the romaine lettuce. And then again, E. coli has been identified as a priority pathogen by three federal agencies and 9 million Americans um, do contract diseases from foodborne pathogens. So um, in my research, I wanted to test if using turmeric as a cure and as a prevention um, for preventing the growth of E. coli. So for my um, alternative hypothesis, um, it was that if the E. coli is already present and turmeric is added to that, then um, the growth of E. coli will decrease. And that was the cure mechanism. And then for the prevention mechanism, I hypothesized that if turmeric is already present, then the amount of E. coli that is able to grow will also be reduced. Um, and then everything about the experiment was controlled, about the petri dishes, and um, they all started with the same amount of E. coli. So I actually um, made my own turmeric extract. I used raw turmeric root and isopropyl alcohol because that was the only um, readily available chemical that I could use to extract the curcuminoid molecules, which is actually what has the antimicrobial property in turmeric. Um, and then the Petri dishes in both the cure and prevent mechanisms were inoculated with 25 microliters of that turmeric extract. Um, and the control just had isopropyl alcohol and no turmeric. So how I measured the growth of the E. coli was using um, a sheet of grid paper. So I put the Petri dishes on top of the grid paper and counted the number of squares that the E. coli filled up on the, um, on the grid paper. And then I was able to use that to do some analysis and calculate the square centimeter growth area and percent growth of the E. coli. So as you can see from this graph here, um, the blue is the control, so just the E. coli, and then the red line is the prevent mechanism. So um, on day zero, that dot shows where I inoculated um, on the first day, and then 
the cure mechanism on day one is when I inoculated it. So the in the cure mechanism, the E. coli was able to grow by itself for the first 24 hours. And you can see at the end of the 10 day experiment, um, both the prevent and cure mechanism did have a lower average end growth. Um, and I forgot to mention that each of these data points is actually an average of eight data points. Um, so you can see that while both of them were effective compared to the control, um, at the end, the prevention mechanism was still the most effective because it had the lowest um, average end growth. So I did two t-tests. One was comparing the control and prevention mechanism, and that was statistically significant. And then the other was comparing the control and the cure mechanism, which was also statistically significant. Um, and then that prompted me to be more interested and try to more accurately simulate um, the post-harvest processing of lettuce and compare that to if turmeric was going to be used as um, an antibiotic regimen and if doctors were going to prescribe it on like a daily dose. So I wanted to redefine the mechanisms and continue my research for another year where I actually renamed the prevent mechanism into the bacteriostatic mechanism and the cure mechanism became the bactericidal mechanism. And so my new hypothesis was that the new mechanisms, um, the bacteriostatic mechanism, so preventing the E. coli growth by preventing the E. coli from contaminating the lettuce in the first place would be more effective than uh, waiting for someone to consume the contaminated lettuce and then treating their symptoms. Um, and then again, I changed my method and I used an edible turmeric extract um, just to make the simulation more accurate because isopropyl alcohol is not safe for human consumption. Okay. Um, and then, so this is just showing how I redefined the mechanisms. Um, so in the bacteriostatic mechanism, I actually um, had the two week period, um, and this is simulating how long lettuce lasts. So the first two weeks um, after harvest is typically how long it takes for lettuce to spoil. And the first three days is typically how long it takes for it to be processed. So um, every day of the first three days, I inoculated the bacteriostatic petri dishes with 10 microliters of the turmeric extract. And then the bactericidal mechanism is actually simulating a different two week timeline. So in this one on day zero is simulating when you would eat the contaminated lettuce and then um, about a six day incubation period before you start showing symptoms. And then on day seven is when you would be prescribed turmeric to try to cure your symptoms. And then from day seven to day 14, every day um, a dose of the turmeric antibiotic. And so that was also an inoculation of 10 microliters of the turmeric extract. So here you can see again, each of these data points is an average of eight. And um, in this, on day 14, you can see that the um, bacteriostatic mechanism did have the lowest average end growth and the bactericidal mechanism was still effective, which was consistent with my previous research um, the previous year. So you can also see that um, while the bacteriostatic mechanism had the lowest average end growth, it also used the least amount of antibiotic or the lower amount of antibiotic. And this is especially important because um, especially now with the antibiotic resistant um, crisis that we're experiencing, um, it's important and doctors are being advised to use less antibiotics, but we're still maintaining or improving the effectiveness of those antibiotics. And so in conclusion, I actually did do another statistical um, validation and compared the uh, bacteriostatic mechanism and the bactericidal mechanism to each other. And um, that was also statistically significant. So in the future, I'm really interested in continuing some microbiology research and testing if E. coli will eventually become resistant to turmeric. And I'm also interested in investigating simpler and more accurate methods of measuring bacterial growth um, using things like a spectrophotometer or the serial dilution method, as well as the kirby Brower zone of inhibition test, which could actually be used to compare turmeric to some other well-known prescription antibiotics. And finally, I would like to thank my teachers, Mr. Raybold and Mrs. Parker for helping me with my research and for making it possible. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions.
Thank you, Hamani. That was awesome. Really quick before we go back to any questions, Hamani, go back to your future research. And I know we talked about this the other day, but one of the things that would be amazing um, if anyone is out there or and that's attending um, would be interested or has the resources or knows a connection, many of these young scientists, not just these three amazing ladies who presented this morning, but many of our young scientists across the state of Ohio want to continue their research and want to do more. But sometimes not having all of the materials in the classroom or not even be able, being able to connect with a larger lab could hinder them from getting that done. And I can tell you as a high school science teacher that I definitely, I don't even have a spectrophotometer in my classroom. So sometimes to do require labs that from the state of Ohio or AP biology curriculum, it gets to be challenging. So Hamani, what are some things for your future research that if you had to put it out there right now that somebody could support you with? Um, it would be a really great opportunity just to learn about other um, research in microbiology and um, to learn about, you know, things that are um, happening with antibiotic resistance. I'd be really interested in possibly, um, you know, helping do some of that research. I'm really interested in infectious diseases as well, um, but also to um, do some of these um, future steps. I don't necessarily have all of the resources at my school to do them. And so if um, anyone um, did have those resources and would be able to kind of direct me to somewhere where I would be able to continue my research further, um, that would be really amazing. That is awesome. Well, I have some questions for you in the chat. And um, I the first question says, how do you explain the drop um, in the prevent and the cure on day two being similar, but the protocol was different. Um, so let me go back to sharing my screen. So um, let me see. Was it um, the previous, the first graph? I think this one. Um, yes. So both of them, um, turmeric was still effective in both of the mechanisms. So um, I did expect that once the turmeric was added to the cure mechanism, that um, the growth would decrease. And for the prevent mechanism, you can see how uh, on day one, it was still um, a lower growth than either the um, cure or the control. Um, so I did expect both of them to have um, a similar decrease just because there was only a 24 hour um, difference in the timing of that. And so um, that's kind of why I decided to redefine the mechanisms further to make sure that it was a more accurate simulation. But yes, they did both decrease and that's because um, that kind of did show that turmeric was effective at decreasing the growth in both of those mechanisms. Thank you. And um, Dr. Vicki Motts, who is from Ohio Northern University, said that due to COVID right now, um, she couldn't have you visit her lab. She would love to connect with you in the future and consult with you online and provide some resources. So that's amazing. We also have another question. Um, what do you understand is the turmeric antimicrobial active? So what is the, with the active ingredient in it? Um, so what is actually in turmeric is um, a molecule co called curcumin or curcuminoid molecules. And um, those are lipophilic molecules. So um, they are attracted to lipids. And um, in bacterial cells, the bacterial cell membrane, actually E. coli is considered a gram negative bacteria. So um, its cell membrane has an additional um, layer with lipopolysaccharides. And so um, those lipopolysaccharides, the um, curcuminoid molecules can actually just um, penetrate straight through them and that can puncture a hole in the cell membrane of the E. coli. And so because once you puncture a hole in the cell membrane, all of the cell machinery and the cell contents will then come out of the cell and that starts the process of the cell dying. So the curcuminoid molecules are what actually um, causes the turmeric to kill the E. coli. So I know we talked about this the other day, or I had mentioned it, that um, I drink tea almost every day with um, turmeric in it. And so I would be 
I would be interested to know how that might be impacting my natural flora in my gut versus the unnatural things that I don't want to get in my gut from the, the things that I consume. So um, I'm challenging you to test that for me, Hamani, okay? <laughs> And you can definitely share that with the tea companies because it's becoming a, a hot topic and a hot selling point for many of our teas, even at Starbucks and everything you see, turmeric, turmeric. And so um, I think it would be interesting as an entrepreneurial project as well to see what's going on with that. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any? Oh, and if you look in the chat, Hamani, um, Dr. Matz has shared her contact information with you. So does anyone have any other questions for Hamani? Well, thank you so much. We thank appreciate you. your presentation. So now we are going to transition to our, we have two college students. Um, we have Luke and Lizeth, and they are going to share their presentations with us. So Luke, if you wanted to transition, share your screen and transition at this time, that would be wonderful. And Luke is a student at Ohio State University and his topic is, does turbidity type affect lower color preference in small mouth bass? So, Luke, I am going to turn it over to you, sir, whenever you are ready. All right, thank you. Uh, can you guys hear me? Absolutely. All right. Yeah, so what I'm presenting today is some research that I did last summer as part of uh, Stone Laboratories Research Experiences for Undergrads program um, through OSU. Um, so this was done at uh, put in bay on Lake Erie, um, and uh, Dr. Suzanne Gray helped me out with this project. Um, so, uh, yeah, exploring the uh, differences in lower color preference among smallmouth bass uh, given different turbidity conditions. So, um, so uh, turbidity uh, to start is suspended particles in the water, and those particles can be algal cells, um, which is the case with. Um, algal turbidity, which is prevalent uh, during the summer in western Lake Erie, uh, as we see these reoccurring algal blooms each summer. And it can also be um, sediment particles uh, suspended in the water. Uh, and this is more prevalent during the spring, especially um, in areas around uh, river outlets where um, these rivers are carrying uh, sediments from the land surrounding the lake uh, into the water. And also after major storm events where uh, the wind can uh, stir up some of the uh, sediments from the bottom of the lake and suspend them in the water. Um, so uh, we know that uh, turbidity uh, can affect the uh, abilities of fish to see their prey. Um, sedimentary turbidity has been shown to reduce the uh, distance from which a fish will react uh, visually to a prey. Um, and uh, Contrarily, um, in some situations, uh, especially under moderate turbidity conditions, uh, the contrast that's created between the prey item and the background can actually improve prey detection. So here are some uh, Daphnia in some uh, moderately turbid water that uh, have been shown to be a little bit more visible because they're translucent um, to larval fish that might be feeding on them. Um, um, but we don't know as much about the effects of algal turbidity on uh, the visual capabilities of sport fish as we do uh, with sedimentary turbidity. Um, so that was one of the uh, knowledge gaps that this project was trying to fill. And um, some previous uh, research in Suzanne Gray's lab has shown that um, the visual capabilities of walleye are impaired more by algal turbidity than by sedimentary tur turbidity. Um, and they've also shown that um, certain lore colors are, uh, they perform better under different uh, turbidity conditions. So for example, um, a black lore might be more effective in algal turbidity uh, because it creates more contrast with the background, the green color than, uh, for example, a yellow uh, lore might. Um, and so 
I've been talking about walleye on this slide. We initially intended to use walleye in this experiment, um, but because of some complications with our uh, experimental design, we had to use smallmouth bass. But this question is still interesting to ask uh, with smallmouth small bass because um, they're a very popular sport fish in Lake Erie and around North America. Um, and if you ask someone who fishes for bass, they'll probably say that they changed the lure that they use based on water conditions. Um, but there's not really a scientific basis uh, that they can base those uh, predictions on. So we were trying to provide some of that scientific context. Um, and so what we did is we used uh, two different lure colors, pink and gold, which are the most popular uh, lure colors for walleye fishing among uh, Lake Erie charter captains. But um, it's still interesting because they have such different uh, like visual characteristics to look at uh, the differences um, for fish other than walleye too. Um, and we were looking at whether these smallmouth bass would prefer a pink or a gold lure in uh, three different treatments, a clear treatment, um, a, a sedimentary turbidity treatment and an algal turbidity treatment. Um, and I forgot to mention that we hypothesized that uh, because there's more contrast between a pink lure and any of these backgrounds that the uh, smallmouth bass would show a preference for the pink lures in all of these treatments. So to test that hypothesis, uh, we used one of the hatchery race ra raceways at the visitor center um, at Stone Lab. And we put a fish on one end of the a section of the raceway to start a trial, um, separated uh, from the rest of the section by a removable divider. And then we hung some lures, a gold and a pink lure on the other uh, end of that section of raceway in front of uh, some submersible pumps. So you can see the lures there. Um, and those pumps would cause them to flutter in the current. So that hopefully the fish would be attracted to the movement um, and the color of the lure. Um, so at the start of each trial, we removed that uh, barrier uh, and allowed the fish to swim toward those lures. Um, and hopefully they would uh, display a preference for one lure or the other. And so uh, to determine which lure color they were showing a preference for, uh, we would record the color of the lure that they approached first, as well as the amount of time that they spent in each quadrant of the section of raceway. So if we divide the, the section of raceway into four, then we would record the amount of time they spent in the section containing the pink lure, as well as the amount of time they spent uh, in the section containing the gold lure. So here's, hopefully this video will play. This is a, just an example of what a, a trial looked like. Oh, maybe not, let's see. Yeah, so the fish is entering the frame from the right there. It's approaching the pink lure first that you can see. And then it changes its orientation toward the gold lure, swims over there and ends up spending a little bit more time next to the gold lure. So in this particular trial, um, we see that it approached the pink lure first and then spent more time next to the gold lure. Uh, although these trials lasted 30 minutes to, um, uh, so that we would record uh, the amount of time they spent near each lure for the entire 30 minute period. Um, this is just a visual of what our three treatments look like. On the left is our, our clear treatment and the center is a sediment uh, turbidity treatment. And on the right is an algae uh, turbidity treatment. And both of those turbidity treatments were at uh, 40 nephilometric uh, turbidity units. Um, so that was kind of to control uh, between those two treatments. Um, and when we did these treatments or uh, these trials, uh, we did use a single fish in all three of the treatments, but uh, we only used it in each treatment once. And we randomized the order in which they uh, experienced those treatments to try to control for any, any uh, acclimation that they might have to these treatments. Um, so this is what we ended up with. We ended up running uh, 15 trials in the clear treatment, 11 in the sediment treatment, and only five in the algae treatment. Um, and then in only a fraction of those uh, trials did the fish actually move uh, between the quadrants. Um, so, and then even beyond that, we only included the trials in which fish actually moved to the lures in our analyses because we couldn't uh, determine which lure the fish was most interested in 
if it didn't interact with either lure at all. So uh, we ended up only having six uh, trials in the clear treatment, five in the sediment treatment, and one in the algal treatment where the fish actually approached the lures. And so here on our x-axis, we have our different treatments. And on the y-axis is the number of trials in which they approached uh, the lure of each color uh, initially. So um, in all of these treatments, they approached the pink lure first, uh, more often than they approached the gold lure first. Um, however, uh, when I used a chi-squared test to uh, determine whether this was a significant difference, it ended up not being statistically significant. Um, here uh, we have the treatments again on the x-axis, and now the proportion of time they spent near uh, the pink lore on the y-axis. So that'll be the time in seconds that they were in the pink quadrant divided by the time in seconds that they were in the gold quadrant. Um, and then our box plots here, that horizontal black bar is the median value. So um, in the clear and sediment treatments, we saw the fish spending more time near the pink lore than the gold lore. Um, and then in our single algal treatment where they move towards the lures, we were spending more time uh, near the gold lure. Um, and so I used a, a linear mixed model to, uh, ended up finding it, there was a significant difference across all those treatments, but um, between the uh, clear and sediment treatments where we had the most trials, there was not a significant difference. So um, they were spending more time, a, a similar amount of time uh, near the pink lore uh, in those two trials. Uh, so if we re revisit this slide real quickly, um, we see that uh, of those five trials in the allergy treatment where the fish moved, they only moved toward the lures in one of those trials. So um, while that's a really small sample size, this might be a suggestion at a result in itself because um, while we controlled the turbidity in each of those treatments, the characteristics of the algal turbidity may have made it more difficult for those fish to see that there were lures on the other side of the section of the raceway. Um, so uh, being that they approached those lures in very few trials, we, we might uh, assume that that could be a cause. Um, so uh, in summary, we saw it. Uh, more often, uh, the fish approached the pink lure than first than the gold lure, uh, although that was not a statistically significant result. Um, we saw the fish spending more time near the pink lure than the gold lure in the clear and, uh, in the sediment trials. Um, and uh, we think this is probably because the pink lure provided more contrast with the background color than the gold lure. Um, and we expect to see uh, that same result in the algae filled water, although we didn't have enough uh, trials to make a reliable conclusion about that. Um, so if I were to do this uh, study again, I might try a slightly different um, experimental design where I'd have multiple fish in the raceway during a trial um, and then maybe move the lure through the raceway um, in more of like a a simulation of a fishing scenario and record the reactions of the fish to that lure. Um, I'd also like to try this with different types of lures because if you fish for bass, uh, you know that the spoons that we used in this study are not necessarily the most popular lure type for smallmouth bass. Um, and I'd also like to try uh, doing a similar study uh, as a controlled angling experiment in the field um, because there may be influences on this that you can't capture in a controlled laboratory setting like uh, we used in this study. So um, finally, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Suzanne Gray and Chelsea Neiman for their guidance on this project. And I'd like to thank uh, Stone Laboratory and the Ohio Sea Grant Program for uh, funding this experiment. So with that, I'll try to answer any questions from the audience. Luke, that is awesome. So a question that is out here are is a very similar question that I have. Um, so do bass and fish in general, do, do they see color like as we see color or is it a shape or? Actually, I have a slide that I removed for the, uh, just for the sake of time. Uh oh, I can't get to the slideshow button because this is. Uh, yeah. Oh, moved for me. Okay. 
Um, but yeah, so fish have uh, bichromatic vision rather than uh, trichromatic vision like humans have. Um, and so uh, they can see most clearly in the kind of green wavelengths and orange and red wavelengths. So maybe those peaks uh, around the red wa wavelengths would make it more easy for them to see a pink lore that's reddish in color than a gold lore. Um, although, I mean, we can still see, like humans can still see red, even though we don't have uh, those uh, cones in that wavelength, uh, that area of wavelength. So um, I'm not sure necessarily how much that would have an influence on which lure they prefer. And is that similar for all fish species or is that, does it differ per species? Um, it does differ slightly. Uh, here I have walleye and smallmouth and they're a little bit different, but then there's a huge diversity among the organisms that we call fish. So there are some fish that um, I'm sure have vastly different visual characteristics. So um, it would probably vary quite a bit. Thank you. So I have a question that says, what lure color do you use for small mouth? Well, um, let's see. I'll now navigate to this slide. Um, there's a, a large range of lure colors that are popular. Um, you'll, a lot of people use these artificial worms that'll be anywhere from like dark green to uh, white. I've seen white soft plastic baits that are black. Um, crank baits, these ones, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but they come in a, a wide range of colors too, from natural looking colors to bright pinks and oranges. So um, there's a, a wide range that people will use. So I really like this question. Um, it says, and, and you started to talk about it a little bit, but it says, what are the limiting factors to conducting research outside the raceway and in nature? And do you think technology is allowing it to be more doable and affordable? Hmm. Well, um, that gives me an opportunity to talk about a, a slightly different study that was done by the Gray Lab. Um, Chelsea, uh, who finished her PhD recently at the Gray Lab, um, she did a project where they developed an app where charter boat captains could um, log the conditions that they were catching walleye in and which lure colors they were using. Um, so that's the perfect example of how technology can make this easier. So um, yeah, that's kind of like a citizen science thing that could um, they could get a whole bunch of data from a whole lot of people um, to try to tease apart these questions. So I have a question as I sit here in South Carolina and um, I say, I say ice or whatever. I know I'm killing the name. Um, the storm just came through and yesterday the sky was clear and the sun came back out and we went to the beach and noticed that the, the trawlers and the shipping boats were all out majorly shipping again. Um, do you think that this would have a use in an oceanic environment or is do you feel that it's more successful in a freshwater um, environment that you were doing your studies in? Sure yeah I mean um, turbidity of both types is prevalent in coastal settings too there's there's algal blooms on the coast um, we see it all the time in the Gulf of Mexico so um, I think it's very applicable also to marine settings um, yeah. Okay. Um, you have a, it says, I fish for smallmouth bass often in inland rivers and creeks. Go-to is a rebel, rebel crawl that is gold and green, but to match the stream conditions and natural bait. So do you think that is something, do you feel that that is probably accurate? <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I know that there are two primary types of strikes that will, like reasons that official strike a lure it'll either think that it's a prey item or it'll be like a reactionary territorial strike where it's just the fish sees something, maybe it's trying to defend its nest, but it, it strikes it just because it doesn't want another fish swimming in the vicinity. So um, with those, those craws, maybe, yeah, maybe they're mimicking prey items very closely and maybe that's 
effective and maybe you need to match that to the local conditions. Um, and then maybe you'll switch to something like one of those neon crank baits and they'll still hit it and that might just be a completely different type of strike. So a question, were your lures identical in shape and because of the sensitivity to sound, um, did they have the same when they were put into the your water stream, same sound released vibrations? Yeah, so I guess I might not have said this specifically, but um, yeah, they're they're very simple lures. They're spoons, so you can't really see them well in any of these pictures. But they're just um, they're uh, essentially here's a picture of a spoon. It's just essentially a a, a piece of metal. Uh, there's not much to it. And yes, they were the same size spoons, same shape. Um, we just painted them differently. So other than that, they were exactly identical. Excellent. And last question, did your raceway have a natural current emulated? Um, no, we didn't have anything to replicate like a natural current. Um, those pumps did create a slight current, which uh, was a little bit of a concern to us initially because it may the fish may be swimming into the current rather than swimming toward the lures. Uh, but we did a few trials without any lures and they didn't seem to swim to those uh, quadrants. Uh, or spend any more time there than they did in the neutral uh, quadrants. Um, and also, because it's a preference study, um, I would think that if the current is the same on each side, then um, based on you can like uh, based on the amount of relative amount of time they spend next to each lure, you can kind of um, assume that that's a constant enough factor that it wouldn't probably influence your results much. Okay. Well, Luke, I have one final question for you. What's your future hold? What are you going to do with this information? How's it going to drive your future? Um, you know, this was a really interesting uh, study that I did last summer um, with kind of fish behavior. But um, most of the research that I've been doing over the past few years is more like, um, well, it's focused on like what affects fish growth, the environmental factors influencing growth in especially juvenile fish. And I've got to say that that's a little bit more interesting to me. Um, <laughs> so I'm planning to go to grad school next year um, to study something along those lines. But yeah, I found this really interesting too. And it was a nice summer project. Excellent. Well, thank you, Luke. We really appreciate your presentation and sharing your expertise. I think we all learned something this morning for sure. So up yeah. next, is our second um, college presenter is Lizeth Sanchez. And Liz Lizeth is from the University of Akron. And Lizeth, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, her presentation is the effect of AC interface on the stress corrosion cracking susceptibility of steels under cathodic protection. Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Sanchez. I'm a PhD student at the University of Akron, and I work in the corrosion engineering area. And today I'm going to talk about my research project, the effect of AC interference on the cracking susceptibility of low carbon steels and their cathode protection. So the content of my presentation will be, first I'm going to talk a little bit about corrosion, what is corrosion, what is AC corrosion, and the significance of the research project with the research goal, the, some experiments that I have done, the results, and the conclusions so far. So first, we need to define what is corrosion. Well, corrosion is everywhere. We can see it in bridges, cars, trucks, in any metallic structure can suffer this natural process. But what is exactly corrosion? Well, according to Fontana, corrosion is the deterioration that can suffer a material because of the reaction with this environment. In this electrochemical reaction, the metal becomes the anode, is oxidized, and um, the electrons are liberated in the chemical, electrochemical reaction. So why is it important to study corrosion? Where first is, well, mainly two reasons. First, the cost and then the safety. According to a NACE report in this study, corrosion it costs to the US around $276 billion annually. 
that is around 3.1% of the GDP. And that doesn't include the indirect costs, like for example, the loss of productivity in the industry. So uh, this is important, the cost, but also the safety. As a result of corrosion, the structure lost the functionality and that can generate failures and catastrophic with catastrophic consequence. The breaches can collapse, the pipelines can break and leak, can cause environmental pollution and a lot of things. So basically that's the reason that it's important to propose innovative solutions uh, to mitigate or prevent this wide range of corrosion problems. Corrosion, we have different types. And um, here I'm showing you just only five. The corrosion can be uniform to the entire surface of the metal, could be with a pipeline internal or external, that will depend on the environment and the material that we use. Could be the interaction between these two metals that can cause a galvanic corrosion. The corrosion is not only uniform, can be localized, like uh, these little holes or pits that you see in the picture, like pitting corrosion. Or corrosion can happen when the electrochemical process is combined with a mechanical deformation, for example, in pipelines, and that produce cracks or a stress corrosion cracking. So it has to be a combined interaction. Specifically in pipelines in the industry, when they are underground, uh, industry use coatings and cathodic protection as a method to prevent or mitigate corrosion. In the cathodic protection, basically we have that the pipeline is the cathode of the reaction and that prevents or mitigates the corrosion. However, pipelines can experience a type of corrosion due to alternating currents, even if the pipeline is cathodically protected, and that is AC corrosion. It's the corrosion that occurs when the pipeline is underground or close to any AC power source, like a high voltage transmission lines or any railroad transit system. So what happened is that the conductors of these power lines produce a magnetic field, and this magnetic field induces an AC voltage through the soil and to the pipeline and change the CV potential that is applied, decrease the effectiveness of the method, and produce an increase in the corrosion rate. So basically, uh, in this, uh, there are different parameters that affect AC corrosion, the proximity of the pipeline to these power lines, the AC voltage that is induced, of course, the current density, the properties of the soil, the composition, because that can change the soil resistivity and that will cause more or less corrosion and the cathodic potential, because basically the oscillation of this uh, potential is on the CP potential. So uh, because of that, uh, now there is few studies that have been done in AC corrosion, uh, specifically the effect of corrosion rate, but less in the AC, inducing cracking on the structure. So why is it important to study cracking susceptibility under AC? Well, first, uh, because these overpotentials that we see here, especially the cathodics, produce hydrogen evolution and hydroxyl ions. But since we have AC, more AC voltage, more oscillation could produce more hydrogen, and this could increase the hydrogen uptake on the surface. If that happens, the hydrogen can diffuse through the steel and can be accumulated, uh, producing embrittlement. Uh, what type of cracking that we know as hydrogen embrittlement? The second reason is because in the failures due to AC in the pipeline, they have found localized corrosions. The one that I showed before, the little pits. Well, these pits can be potentially sites for crack nucleation. So in that case, AC may facilitate the initiation and the propagation of cracking. And that will be the, the, really detrimental for the pipeline integrity. So the goal of the research project is to investigate the effect of these combined AC and CP potentials on the cracking susceptibility, environmental cracking, uh, of low carbon steel, pipeline steel, using tensile tests, electrochemical tests, and fracture morphology analysis. 
So this is uh, an experimental setup, one of the setup that I use is uh, we use a tensile machine to apply at a slow strain rate test in which the sample, the samples that I use are round, round cross-section bars, like you see here in these pictures, are slowly pulled and a constant strain rate, in this case, 10 to minus seven, until the failure. So the sample is immersed in a solution that simulates the soil composition. And we have here the electrodes for the electrochemical test, a potential stat that induce the a cathodic potential and a function generator to apply the AC voltage. These are the conditions, the parameters that I use normally, AC voltage, the cathodic potentials, the frequency is cost constant, six, uh, 60 hertz. And basically here is a picture of the, an image of the sample immersed in the solution during the test. This is done until the sample is, is completely broken. Here we can see how everything is, is changing and the area, the reduction of the area is happening until, until fails. So here I'm showing you some of the results that I have. First, I, I run this experiment only applying cathodic potential. So I had three different, uh, minus 0 0.77, minus 0 0.85, and minus 1.12 at this constant strain rate. As we see here, after the sample is broken, uh, the machine gives us a stress strain curve, so we can see the plasticity, the elastic part and the plasticity part of the material, of the metal. And uh, we see how when the potential is more negative, we have more, uh, less elongation, uh, see the yellow curve, and we have an increase in the susceptibility. Also, you can see that in the elongation chart. So we have an increase in the susceptibility of cracking when the potential shifts to more negative values. After the, the test finish, we analyze the fracture mode with an optical microscope. In the optical microscope, you can see how this normal cup and cone fracture mode that uh, means that the ductility of this, means the ductility of the fracture disappears when we're going to more negative cathodic potential until the reduction of the area is minimal, like in the minus 1.12. So we see how the reduction of the area is the highest with OCP, that means open circuit potential, just in solution, compared with more negative cathodic potential. So after we analyze the fracture mode, we now analyze the fracture morphology, that is the tip of the sample. And in the SEM results that I show here, you can see how Mainly, under uh, only in solution, the sample shows uh, mainly dimples or microvoids, typically of ductile fracture. However, the fracture morphology changed when we are going to more negative cathode potential again. So the, that indicates a brittle fracture behavior in the sample, as we see here, the cleavage planes at 20 microns. So now when we have the more negative cathodic potentials, we have more susceptibility. Uh, I apply now the AC voltage. So this is a result with the cathodic potential that was the more negative with the AC voltage. And in this case, in this experiment, we use uh, an area of 11 centimeters square and then I decrease it. I covered some parts of the sample with an epoxy with the idea of only exposed 3.8 centimeters square. Uh, with that, we have a less area, so we increase the current density that is going to the sample, and we can see better the effect of AC. So in this case, the purple curve that I show here is the one that shows the less elongation, the loss in the ductility, in the ductility compared, for example, with the sample on lean air, and with the sample even with an area that is higher, that is 11 centimeters squared. So we see how the increase in the susceptibility, the cracking susceptibility is because we have an increase in the, in the current density that is going to the sample with a decrease in the area. After that, uh, we ran the test with the cathode potential that was minus one, 0 0.77, but in this case, all with the reduced the area. So here basically we know, we see how the sample only with cathode potential is the blue one, 
uh, shows a good elongation compared with the sampling there. However, when AC voltage, one volt, three volts are applied, the elongation decrease. The mechanical properties of the material are decreasing due to the AC voltage that we are applying. The, basically, the GL stress and the maximum stress of the sample are similar, but we are seeing that, for example, the elastic part overlap, but basically the elongation is decreasing with higher AC voltage. Uh, in addition to that, uh, here I'll show you the AC current densities that we measured during the test with a multimeter, and we see how the AC current density range is higher for the sample with the low, the, with the small exposed area and with the higher AC voltage. So after that, we again analyze it in the optical microscope and the fracture mode. The cup and cone fracture of the neck and rigor is clearly to see for the only cathode potential, minus 0 0.77. However, this cup and crush mode is changing. Now we have more a brittle mode of fracture with more negative cathodic potential and higher AC voltage. What is interesting here is like we have we found pitting corrosion uh, under the sample with more negative cathodic potentials and with the higher AC voltage. That was the minus zero minus 1.12 and minus 0 0.77. However, the pitting severity of these two samples is higher with the sample with minus 1.12. Would you see here the 3D microscope images? The pit depth of the sample that found in the sample was around 90 micrometers compared to the other uh, with the same reducing the area and the same AC voltage that was 10 micrometers. So the severity in this case is higher when we have the higher AC voltage and the lowest cathodic potential. After that, we analyze uh, the SEM morphology, the SEM, the fraction morphology using the SEM. And we see here a comparison of the two cathodic potentials and the sample in air that is basically ductile. We see the reduction of the area is clear and the microvoids are that showing a ductile fracture mode. However, with the sample with minus 1.12 for all of them, even with cathodic, with, even with AC voltage and without AC voltage, the morphology is similar to quasi cleavage planes. So it's basically brittle for both. However, when the sample is around minus 0 0.77, this uh, fraction morphology has a change to ductile, from ductile to brittle morphology when the AC voltage is increasing. We also found secondary cracking in the sample and the minus 1.12, which is an indication of brittle fracture. And in the lowest cathode potential, as you see here at higher magnification, 200 nanometers, we have micro cracking. In addition to that, I show you here the uh, end study of the SEM, but not the fractured morphology, just the part outside the gate section. Uh, we see how there is some pits that they are bigger uh, with the lowest cathode potential. The micro cracking is still inside of the speeds is present. And we found that some pits are connected through crack. So crack, we can see how cracking evolves. Ev is this is a crack evolution from the pit. Uh, in addition to that, I found secondary cracking in the sample under minus, under one volt AC. So this is, uh, this is related with the susceptibility that has the sample uh, with AC voltage, uh, the susceptibility to cracking. So the conclusions that I have is like, first, we know how the cathodic potential only inside the, in the solution affects the ductility of the material and increase the uh, cracking susceptibility. The highest susceptibility was found with the lowest cathodic potential and uh, could be attributed to a hydrogen uh, embryonic mechanism. When the AC voltage is applied, we saw how the susceptibility increased with the AC current densities under the cathodic potential. Now, in the, the, the result was different and that depends on the cathodic potential applied. For example, for the minus 0 0.77, 
the result is that there is a transition from ductal to bridal when the AC is applied. For the lowest cathode potential, we found pitting, uh, the pitting was severe in these conditions, and the fracture morphology was pretty similar between with and without AC voltage. So um, that is that. Th thank you so much. And uh, you have any questions? Elizabeth, we have a couple of questions, um, and I have a couple. Of, I have a quick question. So, first of all, what what is the the real world application? As someone who is is this is not their field of study, but why would the general person want to know this information? Well, um, as I said before, corrosion is a really dangerous problem. And maybe for someone that is not working in the oil and gas industry in a different uh, industry, they, they maybe may not understand that much, but that could have, if there is an explosion or a break in the pipeline that can be catastrophic for not only for the industry, for everyone, the okay. damage in the environment, the pollution, and all the catastrophic consequences can affect all of us. Absolutely. So I had a question and um, Rod Sheets had the same question. Most of the Western hemisphere uses a 60 Hertz AC voltage, but most of Europe and Asia uses 50. What do you think, do you think that would make a difference in your results? Well, um, AC frequency of course change the, the risk, could change the results. Different papers established that in the literature that the AC frequency is the higher, that the AC frequency is not going to have that much of effect. But if you decrease the AC frequency 30, 20 hertz, that is going to have a lot of impact. However, 50 to 60 hertz is not that much of a difference. I had different preliminary results with, with both and it's not a significant change. Okay, Lizeth, so the question is, where do you go from here? What does your future entail with your research and um, at University of Akron? Well, um, after we have these preliminary results, uh, right now I'm proposing a different type of experiments. And since we have an idea that maybe hydrogen can cause the cracking and the structure, um, developing a different hydrogen permeation experiments. And when we expose a sam the samples, the carbon steels to uh, the same AC voltage, cathode protection, but we, uh, with that, we measure the hydrogen that is diffusing through the steel. And we can compare if there is any difference, is an increase or decrease, and that could be correlated with my experiments. In addition, I'm proposing, um, Again, stress is SSRT, the tensile test, and thinking that maybe we can not only apply all of the sine wave cycle, maybe just the positive, have like a rectified wave, so only apply the, the positive cycle and then the negative and see which one is the one that is causing more effect in the cracking. So yeah, I have some experiments that I need to, to finish before I finish the PhD. Awesome. Does anyone have any other questions for, oh, we have, let's see, does the SEM you have access to have an EDS detector on it? Yes. Okay. And can, oh, she said, great. Awesome. That's exciting. Thank you. Well, Liz, th thank you so much for sharing your presentation and we wish you the best of luck on future um, research. So it sounds like this could save some people a lot of money and save our environment at the same time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. So next up, um, we are going to transition to our professional presenters and we have three professional presenters today. Um, first up, we have Dr. Bilal Gonin. And um, if you would like to go ahead and share your screen and get set up, that would be great. And we have, um, uh, Bilal will be presenting on identifying transaction patterns on illegal darknet markets. So I told him the other day that it was, this might make me 
a little nervous after the presentation. I'm just kidding. Absolutely kidding. But I think this is going to be really interesting for all of us. So um, Bilal, whenever you are ready, we're going to turn it yes. over to you. Perfect. All right. Uh Right. Thanks so much and uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Bilal Gonan and I have my PhD in computer science and now I am working as assistant professor at the information technology uh, at the University of Cincinnati and I have uh, I advise several uh, master's students and this work uh, was done mainly by my master's student uh, Victor Adewepo um, so I was going to present that, but because of the pandemic, now I am presenting online. And so the title uh, of this, um, let me move this actually. Okay, uh, the Beyond the Surface Web, uh, Characterization of Darknet Activities and Cyberspace. So uh, first of all, uh, I will give a brief introduction uh, about what uh, surface web or public web is, and then deep web and dark web. So the public web is what we know that uh, mainly use, uh, such as Facebook, uh, and then you uh, visit your school website. So this is the information that you would normally find on search engine. And then uh, we will talk on the deep web. Deep web is something that is not indexed by the search engine. Uh, so it, and also it doesn't require uh, authentication. And dark web is, where the especially some of the uh, illegal activities takes place uh, information that is not accessible by even normal internet browser okay um, so public web is uh, this is the, the crawler the search engines goes to website and from the website to other websites crawls and uh, collects the information and when you search uh, on the google and then it just brings you the information that it uh, collected before already and then the current web getting deeper with none uh, actually let me minimize this i'm sorry um with non-trivial access okay um all right so what is deep web the normally not accessible through general purpose search engines and um, so example used car uh, radio stations patent so you need to uh, put information, uh, you need to query the database and then you explore integrity. Okay, so these are the some uh, query sources. Um, so it requires extra uh, effort by the user. Okay, and so deep web, so this is another one. So some of the things that um, content is not uh, available to the search engines, such as sub subscription needed and you need to pay extra and some encrypted content uh, that means um, the your emails okay the search engine uh, should not uh, cannot get into your emails because it is password protected and uh, this changes actually it says deep web is reportedly 500 to 1000 times greater than the surface web okay this number changes in some of the uh, places you see 300 400 uh, but um, the overall idea is that the surface web, which is visible web, only tip of the iceberg. Okay, the majority is uh, in the behind. And so deep web, uh, a part of the worldwide web that is not indexed by the search engine and content hidden behind the HTTP forms. Uh, and also you must know the URL or IP address. And sometimes you need uh, access permission such as password and so on. Uh, as you see here, we have surface web on the top and then deep web. And also inside of the uh, deep web, we have dark web. Uh, I will talk in a, in a minute. And deep web approximately makes 99% of the internet. Um, okay, so let me go uh, very fast. Um, so examples, online banking. So uh, you uh, log in and you put your credentials, password and so on, you get to the, so your uh, bank information, how much money you have should not be crawled by the Google or Yahoo search engines. Um, okay, now we come to dark web. So only accessible through alternative web browsers, Tor browser. And so this ensures anonymous browsing, which is important for whistleblowers, journalists. So a dark web 
do not consider that as bad only. So there are things that uh, dark web uh, is good uh, for that. For for example, in some countries, uh, the the authority countries, the government may not want the citizens to visit the CNN.com, BBC.com. So uh, so that uh, the by using the dark web, those people can uh, get the correct information, not uh, the uh, false information uh, given them by the their government. Also, if there is something wrong in their country, they have voice. They can raise their voice uh, and then make uh, hear about that. Okay, um, so let me uh, continue. And uh, so uh, there are uh, a lot of things also uh, illegal activities uh, going on in the dark web. And uh, example, uh, Silk Road uh, Anonymous Marketplace, uh, crypto. Um, okay, so um, so it, the Silk Road created by this person and then uh, finally arrested uh, and then sentenced to the life. Uh, in prison, uh, sold illegal uh, goods such as drugs, weapons, and and then uh, delivered through mail. Okay, uh, and after Silk Road was shut down, other markets uh, took uh, its place, and also uh, these markets uses the cryptocurrency. Uh, as you know, the Bitcoin is the the famous of it, and the the advantage of the cryptocurrency for them is that it is uh, difficult to trace back. Um, so people just exchange the money and then uh, they still remain anonymous. Uh, Darknet, only 2% of the internet can be searched by Google. And Creator is actually US military Navy uh, branch. And the idea was that to, um, to uh, restrict the communication. And then uh, some of the developers make this uh, open uh, source. And then uh, a lot of people, uh, millions of people in the world uses the uh, Tor network. And then uh, there are a lot of uh, good things, as I mentioned, uh, to uh, get over the censorship uh, and by the some dictator uh, countries. Uh, but there are also illegal activities. Um, okay, so disclaimer, the dark net contains illegal sites and substance. So you should use that responsibly, okay? Um, so darknet in general may be used for uh, several reasons, computer crime, hacking, file corruption, and then uh, protecting dissidents from political uh, reprisal. So this is good, uh, okay? And file sharing, uh, and then, you know, the pornography, uh, confidential files, and illegal counterfeit software, and so on, and sale of restricted goods market, and whistleblowing and uh, news leaks. Okay, so how are credentials uh, compromised, uh, phishing and, and so on? So anyway, somehow, so I, I need to uh, move uh, fast. Uh, somehow uh, your credentials are compromised. Uh, uh, what can the attacker do with those credentials? They send spam uh, email accounts and install malware on compromised systems, uh, exfiltrate sensitive data, identity theft, and so on. And so these are some of the numbers uh, average number data records per company. Um, so, okay, so the com the data are uh, lost, uh, breached, and protecting against credential compromise. Uh, okay, so I will, and also data is actually sold in darknet. And so, for example, when the Facebook data was breached a few years ago, um, as far as I remember, uh, it was sold uh, for three dollars uh, per. Uh, for uh, each person's data, so three dollars. So it is ranged between one and eight dollars. Um, okay. And the anonymous internet, uh, as you see here, uh, USA right here. So daily Tor users uh, per uh, one hundred thousand internet users. Uh, so some European countries has a lot of uh, usage. And uh, okay, and then you can see the map. And uh, actually, the Tor is not the only one uh, active darknet. So, but Tor is the I would say maybe the number one. And there is some others: Invisible Internet Project uh, I2P and Freenet. Uh, so, based on the peer-to-peer -peer networks, 
and retro share and so on. Um, so Tor uh, history, so I will uh, talk uh, on the Tor a little bit. Uh, so developed by the US government actually. Um, and then it's still mostly funded by US government. Uh, so today millions of users. Um, and then this is the other one. So I will skip this one. Uh, Tor uh, Onion Router, okay? And so I will explain uh, in a minute what that means. That means actually the messages are encapsulated in multiple layers of encryption. So it is similar that you have message and you put the message in an envelope and you put that envelope into a larger envelope and then you put that into a larger envelope and so on. And transmitters determines the route before sending any data. Um, okay, so uh, browse the web uh, anonymously and okay. And, and so there are some repetitions, so I skip. Uh, Tor, uh, Tor routing, so you have Tor client and destination, okay? And then we have entry and exit relay. And then you have middle. So this middle uh, relay can be not just one, but multiple. And, and then it is also encrypted. Uh, so encryption means that um, you, you get the data and then you use also a key and then you change the original data so that uh, even if uh, some the so, someone in in the middle of the transmission if they read your data your message they will not understand because it is encrypted and then when it comes to destination so it is uh, decrypted by using the key and so the this is the regular web browser so imagine that this is the uh, i don't know maybe um, google dot or facebook.com and this is your uh, website and then i'm sorry and then the traffic uh, is on the surface web and Tor network, uh, so when you make the uh, send a message, uh, you, your uh, software chooses randomly some uh, nodes, and then your package uh, follows that one. And then, so here's an example. So out of so there are multiple uh, Tor nodes, and then your system chooses maybe three of them, and then sends the message. So Alice sends to Bob, and so on. Okay. Um, can be used to create private. So let me go back to here. Um, so when you, when Alice sends message to this one, one of the tours, this tour actually doesn't know the destination, uh, but it knows that it gets it from the Alice, and then Alice knows the next one. And then uh, because um, there, there are multiple envelopes uh, inside of each other, when the uh, the first node opens the first envelope, looks at uh, looks at the inside, and there is a, a smaller envelope, but it is encrypted. So it doesn't know the actual message, but it knows the, the next address, and it gives it uh, to the next uh, Tor node. Um, OK, so that's why uh, the people becomes uh, anonymous here. So this Alice, actually, when we say Bob, this Bob could be just a, a CNN.com, for example, uh, not uh, illegal activity. However, uh, imagine that the Alice is a country that is not supposed to watch CNN.com. Okay, and then uh, because the uh, it is anonymous uh, through this, uh, it, it reaches to CNN, and even the CNN.com doesn't know uh, where the Alice is. Okay, so this is how anonymity is achieved. And so here uh, you have multiple envelopes uh, put inside, and then. At the next one, the uh, we have two uh, envelopes and then one envelope and then finally uh, message here and then it is decrypted and then goes to the bump and routing uh, un, uh, ra union uh, onion routing uh, we have router A key router B key and then each of them is encrypted and then they are decrypted by these keys okay um, okay so. Uh, okay, so uh, pros, anonymity, free, freedom of speech, uh, secure communication, but cons, slow connection, terminated, and so on. And deep web, um, okay, uh, content that is only available through specialized uh, anonymization. Okay, so I think I am almost out of time. Uh, let me skip some of these. So this is uh, how it looks, the Tor, um, so Tor project. And, Okay, so if you look at the address bar, 
It is a long string dot onion. So it is not like facebook.com or anything.com. Okay, so this is a long one. And even if you know this address, and if you put that your uh, Chrome uh, or uh, Internet uh, Explorer or Internet Explorer or uh, Firefox, you are not going to see this page because this page is available to uh, Tor network only. And so there are, uh, as you see, there are a lot of illegal activities uh, and then uh, selling the uh, drug, the Ill illegal drugs and so on. But there are also activism. So not everything is illegal, okay? Um, so here, uh, Bitcoins is used for the uh, currency of the deep web. Uh, so Bitcoins is an electronic cash system uh, using the peer-to-peer -peer networking. Um, okay, so, and then this uh, cryptographic proof to enable irreversible payments between parties without relying on trust. And basically, um, even if there, there are some illegal activities, for example, there is a drug seller. Uh, so drug seller um, uh, builds a, a trust uh, and then people uh, rate them, they put commands. So it's very similar to how Amazon works or eBay works. Uh, and then the buyer looks at the, how trusted these um, drug seller is, uh, but drug seller, of course, still bad, but they are trusted in terms of uh, they get the money and they deliver the illegal product. And then, uh, so it is totally based on the uh, trust system. Um, okay, so this is an example from the Silk Road. So there are um, some me messages. And our work. So in our work, uh, we provided a detailed overview of the um, work on darknet and anonymizing services and, and unrevealed what is known about de-anonymizing the Tor services, illegal drug deals and in cyberspace uh, and internet, internet crimes and users' motivation on the darknet. And also we identified uh, areas for further research uh, for the pattern of transactions in darknet forums and optimizing the data in supporting the law enforcement agencies. And also we propose a model to examine and investigate the online uh, illicit markets. And also uh, we propose a 3D framework to signal the, uh, the alert before the uh, actual occurrence of the threat on the surface um, uh, occurs. And uh, our methodology combines information uh, extracted from the deep web. Uh, through the smart web crawler uh, with uh, social, social, personal and uh, technical indicators from Twitter. And also uh, we have been able to provide detailed overview of the pattern, a uh, sophisticated pattern of the cyber attacks. Um, okay, and also we provided overview of the occurrence of cyber attacks in different states in the United States. And we also analyzed and detailed um, number of records breach in each state and time series of yearly attack. So we list them. And okay, I think I talk about this. Yeah, so that was a. Um, okay, so this one, uh, our uh, proposed uh, framework aims uh, providing rep rapid support to law enforcement agencies in monitoring related cybercrime threats and also provide cybersecurity analysts a tool that can be easily deployed in preventing cyber attacks, also responding uh, spontaneously to newly identified threat before emerging on the surface web. Because if it uh, happens on the surface web, uh, it is costly uh, to uh, fix the problem. Um, so finally, uh, think once before you act, twice before you speak, and three times before you post on Facebook. So this is my email address. Uh, so if you have further questions or if you want to see the, the long version of our uh, published papers, uh, please just contact me or for also any uh, research collaboration. Uh, this is my email address. So uh, this is all. Uh, thank you very much. And if there is any questions or comments, I can try to answer. Allow, thank you so much. I am. Um absolutely freaked out now. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I have a, a question. My email um, used to get spoofed the best way my husband could describe it. It was spoofed. It wasn't, um, someone didn't have my address, but they were spoofing me 
is that an example of a breach from the dark webs and uh, yes yes most likely uh, it, it, either they uh, collected your data somehow by sending you phishing uh, emails and then you went to a website and that look very similar to what you, you normally see for example it could be your school systems login page and then you put your username and password and then they collect it or they may have purchased it from somewhere else yeah third parties wow yes. so then that's my follow-up question do identity protection services like xander that we pay for um my family pays for each month do those help to protect i mean <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, so uh, I don't know for specific companies, but yes, uh, those companies have some protection. But the uh, the uh, these attackers getting smarter and smarter. So if you find a, a solution, they get around it the the next day, and then they. Uh, but these companies definitely helps. But I don't know for specific companies, of course. Right, smarter and smarter, and younger and younger. I keep hearing about high school students who are hacking into main. Um, frames and and things like that <laughs> yes you are correct well i am looking to start a podcast in the fall and i absolutely would love to have you on it and talk to you more about this because i definitely love your last slide where it says think three times before you post to facebook so and i think mm -hmm. all of our our young scientists and people around ohio and the world could benefit from that so that's for sure yes, so that, that would be a pleasure for me Thank you so much. Does anyone have any other questions? I think everyone's going in and changing their uh, usernames and passwords as we speak to all of their accounts. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you. And next up, we have um, Dr. Yeltsin Karatas. And um, Yalsin, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, that would be great. So um, can you and, see? Yep, I can see you and I can see your screen. And Yalsin's presentation is um, entitled Public Key Crypto System Based on Lower Triangular Matrices. And Yeltsin, we want to welcome you to our Celebration of Science and whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. I want to thank the organizers uh, for giving me the chance to talk in here. Um, so it's kind of uh, now after this talk, great talk from uh, Dr. Gunan, I'm going to be uh, kind of talking about the security side or in uh, how the math, like math works in the security. So what we did. So I'm I'm a uh, I'm a math faculty at UC Blue Ash, um, and um, I'm my research is in the area of algebra, and I'm looking for in the recent years I'm looking for the um, application side of uh, algebra and uh, cryptography is one of them. So we did something um, around like um, 2019, like recently, uh, by generalizing your work, and I'm going to be talking about that one, of course, with brief introduction. And uh, this work, this work is a joint work with Dr. Uh, Louis, Dr. Gunen, uh, previous speaker, and then uh, Said Warlolu from uh, UC. So um, just to, just briefly, uh, I'd like to go through what so with, about some terms. So first, cryptography is the design side of uh, those security systems, uh, and I'm of course like this can be done by using computer science. I'm at the math side. So I'm going to be talking about the algebra mathematics side of it or number theory side of it. So cryptanalysis is the uh, is the breaking of the systems. So again, we use mathematics in here or different tools. And the cryptology is uh, the term that we use for the combination. So it includes all. And uh, what we have in here is first we have the system. We have uh, the plain text. We want to uh, just simply um, send a message to somebody. That's what we call the plain text, the actual message. And then the cipher text will be the encrypted message. So we will encrypt that. And then that's what we call the cipher text. And what we have is just the key or the keys. Uh, and these are used for encryption decryption. So you're gonna see that in a minute on, 
on the deck and what really that means. And uh, we have, um, mainly we have two types of encryptions. One is the symmetric and the other one is the public key, or sometimes we call symmetric and um, asymmetric. And um, we use many mathematical tools to create these systems like modular arithmetic groups, rings, uh, matrices, all these are, I can say kind of algebraic tools. They have connection in algebra and um, that side is just where I'm really interested in, in my research recently, I mean, for the last three, four years. So um, the first one, the symmetric encryption. So it's really plain. I mean, uh, you have a key and both parties have the same key and you um, encrypt your message according to that key and you send the message and the guy on the other side gets the message and decrypt it by using the same key. It's like, you may think of this way, you have a locker, you lock it and send it to somebody. They have the same key to open it. So it's basically the, that idea. And these type of crypto systems, we have shift ciphers, substitution ciphers. I'm gonna talk about one of them. And um, these are really, you will see that uh, it's, they, they're much faster than the public key algorithms. So that's commonly used. We have two from DES and AES, Advanced Encryption Standard and um, the Data Encryption Standard. So um, these are faster algorithms. These are really used a lot in, 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 um, in real world um, applications. Uh, and they have short keys. They don't have really long keys uh, because it's kind of like you're sharing the same key uh, and nobody really knows that. And uh, the, like only the parties who are using the keys know the actual key. But we have here a problem. Uh, the problem is how to share the key. Like for example, let's say you want to message somebody, like you want to you want to contact somebody from let's say Japan, and how can you come together before to share the keys? That's like one problem. And that's why people thought of a system in which uh, we can do that publicly. And we have a second type, which is uh, the public key encryption. So in this case, we have different keys and the keys are not shared with uh, other parties. Of course, the private keys are not shared, but the public keys are shared. And like, to be honest, there are great mathematical tools, mathematical problems to uh, create crypto systems of this type. And the first one was created recently. I mean, I say recently because it's only like 40 years ago, at 1978, the famous RSA crypto system. I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, but this case, we have two different private keys. And there's a public key, of course, public key, everybody knows that, but there's a private hidden key that nobody shares with anyone. So it's like, it's like uh, there's, a, there's, a, um, there's a great trust on this one. Like, I mean, um, it's kind of, uh, you don't need to share that key with the other party. They don't have to know that key. So we have uh, Diffie-Hellman, RSA, Algama. We have uh, some couple like nice ones. And actually our work is related to this, um, this part public key encryption. And then these are, uh, you can still keep the same key for a long amount of time. This is good for key distribution. It's not good for, for example, texting. It's not good for messaging. It's good for key distribution. Like first you share the keys by using a public key encryption, and then you just go back to symmetric encryption because now you share the keys. So you can do it faster. So um, I wanna talk about the substitution cipher first. Um, it's it's one of the common. I don't know, like if you have ever done that uh, in in your life. Uh, but when when I was in high school, we were creating like simple alphabets for with our friends. Like for example, for the letter A, you put a star. For B, you put alpha. For C, you put triangle. And then you write a message, so nobody knows that. This is exactly what it is: the substitution cipher. Uh, you replace each letter by a different one. And it's like a one-to-one -one correspondence. So if you have a if you have a word, that word uh, will be encrypted into another word, and that encryption cannot be same for two different words. So it's like one-to-one. -one. one word goes to another word. So in this case, I just write one. Um, so uh, you have uh, you replace each letter by another one, and. Uh, the number of keys is really enormous. I mean, uh, like in, in this case, for example, Eagle is encrypted to T, D, Z, O, T. And uh, of course, the next question is, this, is, is this system secure? Can we break it? And for many decades, people believe that this system was really secure. I mean, because in the next uh, 
item, you will see the number of possible keys is 26 factorial. It's like four times 10 to the 26. It's a huge number. You can't use brute force. Brute force means you simply try every possible key until you get the correct one. So you can't do it for this case. It's not, it's what they call computationally infeasible. I mean, you can't do it. But later on, people realize that we have the frequency analysis. Like in, 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 in for example, in, 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 a, uh, in a text of let's say like three paragraphs, you can easily figure out uh, the most like commonly used letter because there's a frequency analysis for the English alphabet. And by using that one, actually, you can break the system. It's not that hard. If you have a long enough message, then you can easily break it. And there are examples in the undergraduate textbooks that, uh, that you can do this easily. For example, the, the most uh, commonly used letter is E and then T, A. And you look at, you look, you look at your uh, text and then you simply just uh, list all of them with their frequency and then you match them and you eliminate one by one and it really works. I mean, there are examples as I said, uh, but if you, if you do it for a short message, then yeah, it is secure. Like there's no way that somebody can get it because like if you, if you send a message for let's say 10 letters, well, it's, it's not possible to get it from here. So um, this is an example of a symmetric key. So both parties have the same key, which is uh, this one and they just decrypt and encrypt accordingly. Now, uh, now this is really because of time, I, that was only my example about the symmetric key. Now, the public key, this is so beautiful. I mean, I really like this, uh, the way how numbers work. So um, RSA, it's uh, Rives, Shamir, and Edelman. They tried like 40 something crypto systems to find something public and they couldn't do it. Like Edelman was the, uh, the mathematician, I guess, he was always breaking the crypto system the other two found. And at the 42nd, I think, try, they find the system. This is a plain, like, simple system, but it really works nice. And the problem, like, you're embedding a mathematical problem, a tough mathematical problem, to make the system secure. So how does that work? Here we go. I mean, integer factorization problem. If you, um, if you, uh, simply decompose an integer into prime numbers. That's what we call the prime factorization of that number. Like for example, 10 is two times five. You have eight, two to the third, all that type of uh, stuff. I mean, this is, if you have a number which is a, uh, which is a composition of two primes, it's really difficult to find that if the, if the number is a long one. Now, that's uh, what we call uh, the, like the difficulty of integer factorization. So, um, for example, I mean, uh, the hardest instances of these problems are semi-primes. So it's like product of two prime numbers. Now I can show you this in here. Uh, here, this list. For example, you have 15. Yeah, you can do it easily. 143, maybe a little bit more try. And four digits, well, that's still not that bad. I mean, even if you, if you use a computer, it might be really helpful. You can use a calculator. It's not really that bad. You can do it on the same, like uh, on a short amount of time. But now what if you have an integer, which has 600 digits? So it's, a, it's, it's simply a, a, a product of two primes and really this doesn't work. I mean, uh, it's, it's impossible if you make correct choices. Of course, when first the system established, people attack to it, like try to find ways to break it down. They find some certain conditions in which the system really breaks down. But those conditions are really like basic conditions. Like it says, for example, if you choose a prime number to be around like 10, digit, 10 digits and the other one to be 50, then this can, of course, like your one of your primes should be like, both of your primes should be uh, with long digits. And roughly I can say, if you're talking about a number of 600 digits, you're talking about two primes of each of length, like 300 digits. So it's really kind of like 300 digits means uh, you're talking about 10 to the 10 to the 300. It's impossible to try that. It's uh, computationally infeasible. Uh, so that's why this system is one of the secure ones. Still, it's secure. I mean, sometimes if you look at that, you know, that luck sign on uh, the browser, sometimes it says like RSA is, is used for key distribution. Of course, this is for key distribution. For messaging, it doesn't work. I mean, it definitely fails. So uh, what's the system? So we choose two prime numbers 
and then we multiply them and then we find phi. Phi is the Euler phi function. It's simply, uh, right now it's just, um, so it's uh, P minus one, Q minus one. Uh, I just defined it in here, but you may think of this way. It's the number of numbers, number of values, number of numbers less than N, which are relatively prime to N. For example, when I say 15, I'm talking about two, but not three, four, and then not five, not six, no seven, eight, and so on. The number of primes that's relatively prime to that given number. This plays an important role. Algebra comes into play with this uh, system. So, so next we define an integer e, and this e should be relatively prime to phi. So whatever phi you find in here, it should be relatively prime. And there are conditions on this e, but there are like, you can easily choose one, which is for example, is it like there's for example, a low exponent attack. If your exponent is really low, the system may fail. So uh, we choose the inverse. Now the public key, I establish n and e, and private key is D. D is what you keep for yourself and N and E is what you send. See, the guy doesn't know your actual key. And then uh, the guy takes the message M and then sends you N to the E. So it's so nice. If somebody wants to break the system, they have to find D. But if they want to find D, they have to know phi. If they want to know phi, then they have to find the factors of N. So it goes back and back and at the end, they can't find it. So, um, and then you just write C to the D, the inverse of this E at the exponent to get the message back. I mean, it's really a simple system, but it uses a great mathematical problem for the security. And uh, I put an example here, take 17 and 11. So their product is 187 and the phi is 160. So you cho I choose E to be seven and then D will be 23. So I'm sending seven, but I'm keeping 23 for myself. So the guy takes the message, uh, 88, takes the power seven of it on mod 186 and it sends me 11. So 11 is the, 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 uh, the ciphertext. M88 is the message. So if I get 11 to, the, to 11 to the 23 and 23 is my private key, I get the message back as 88. So um, it's, um, I mean, it's really a simple system, but uses a, uh, uses a mathematical problem for, so I mean, I just want to go talk about my hours, like this work. This is about matrices. It looks a little bit technical compared to the previous one. Previous one is simple, but this one's a little bit technical. We inspired from a work done in 2015. We try to generalize that one. So we use the mat matrices. So it's kind of like this algebraic structures, you know, uh, composed of like um, arrays. And we have certain multiplication in them. Uh, addition, subtraction, all those algorithms work. And the beautiful part is the multiplication is not commutative. That means like you multiply two and three, three and two, you get the same number, but for matrices that doesn't work. They're what we call non-abelian. So um, we use, uh, we choose two matrices from this set. See the diagonals are same and it's lower triangular. If somebody wants to do it with upper triangular, it will work. Then we define four automorphisms. Here, the interesting part is this part. This is what we call a conjugation problem. Like I, I, I'm giving you V A inverse V A. And then from these two, can we find A? That's it. That's a big problem. That's what we call the conjugation problem. So um, since this is a hard problem, this system becomes secure. But of course, for certain parameters, the system again fails. Like for example, if you do it two by two, it doesn't work. It's not going to be secure. The system will work but it's not gonna be secure. So you have to choose a size, maybe three, four, depending on how fast your uh, computer works. But we, we, we didn't take a look at the computer side, maybe yet. So what we define is we define four automorphisms. Automorphism means uh, it takes all the elements into the same group of elements. So it's like one-to-one -one and it preserves the operation. So multiplication on the left side in V also preserved and multiplication on the right side. So, um, we, how do we define, we take an invertible matrix, we apply our automorphisms to this invertible matrix and its inverse, and we send, n is really known, I mean, it's the mod value, of course, definitely known, but we send rho n and sigma n inverse here. Why do we define these two in here? Because we want to just put some more security in there. It's abelian, but these are the lowest powers that we can use. Like somebody can say, hey, I'm going to use a to the third b, that's fine, but A to the third makes your system more slow. 
like slower because it's the third power. Now, the least that we can use is a second. And I choose, um, I choose my message from any matrix. It doesn't need to be invertible. And the guy chooses an X from H. Again, this H in mu is just some parameters to increase the security because it's not easy to find them. And at the end, applies the automorphism with this X to the ones that I send from left side and embed the M, the message on the one of them. If you embed it to the second one, it will work again. And um, at the end, sends this message. This is the ciphertext. It looks long, but, but it works. It really works. I mean, uh, nobody knows what N is, but once you multiply all in a certain way, then it works. How does that work? You can get the message back if you apply chi inverse delta to second message and multiply it by the first message. That gives you N. And it's really tough because they had to find these two in order to get the message. I mean, uh, again, it goes back to that conjugation problem. See, I mean, if you want to know this map, if you want to know these two maps, then you have to solve this conjugation problem. So um, I put an example here. See, I got two matrices, five, 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 six, six, seven, and then three, 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 one, one, six. They, they have to be same, the diagonals. And then do I define for automorphisms, choose an invertible matrix, and find the inverse and apply those two automorphisms, rho and sigma to n and n inverse, and send whatever I got with the n, of course. n is really, I mean, public, that's the modular value. So uh, we take a message and we take an x, and be careful, x should be from h. And for a crypto system, all these should be public. Like you, somebody from outside should know what RSA means. I mean, if you, for example, lock the locker and hide the key, that's not cryptography. I mean, it's kind of like you lock the locker, you take the key, and you tell them, here's a system. Just try to break it. If it's not breakable, then that's secure. So uh, I send these to, and I choose this mu just to increase security. Of course, it's like a small parameter to increase the number of equations the attacker needs to solve. Um, and really, if I apply these two maps to C2 and multiply it by C1, I'm going to make I'm going to get the message M. And um, yeah, uh, this is all for uh, for now. Um, I hope I didn't go too fast. But yeah, we we have more details about this. If you want to talk about that, um, I I mean you can find my email my email address on the UC Blue Ash website. So so I mean thanks for listening. Thank you, Yalsin. So from what my my hearing of um, your presentation and Bilal's presentation is, he's doing this discovery and you're working on the science to make sure that it's not getting, the information is not getting hacked. Is, is that making it, the information more secure? Is that the, the connection that, um, to put it out there for the real world or companies and things? I mean, that's, um, so I, I really just, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not feeling like exactly, it's, it's kind of like really nice stuff, of course, but um, mine is kind of uh, more, I can say like abstract, but he's kind of, when we calibrate, they try to look at the practicality side. Like for example, how fast the system is working, uh, how many minutes it takes to encrypt, decrypt, how many seconds, or um, is it, um, is it really uh, kind of like uh, practical to use? You know, uh, like it, it, you, you know, like from the math perspective, you just throw in something, say, hey, here's a new system. And they on their side, um, it's really nice to work with computer scientists and this because you can do something which will not completely make sense. And they simply tell us, hey, this is really practical or not, you know? Um, so that's how we collaborate. I love the collaboration piece. I think it's it's really important for all scientists uh, and, and including our younger scientists to understand that collaboration is so vital. Um, and I, I think that even without, and it's important for them to know, even without being in the room together, you can still have positive science and authentic science research and um, collaboration happening, even in this day and age of, having to quarantine and COVID and everything else. So thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? I had put my funny question in there and, or comment about the emojis. So 
maybe. <laughs> I know my son likes to use his uh, communication with me. I feel like I have to break his code sometimes when he sends me messages and all emojis. So, <laughs> well, thank you very much. Oh, we've got, we've got a, um, yes, practical is when you put it into the software, but is this possible while and still keep it from being decoded? So, um, so do you think I mean, once it goes into the software, can you can keep it from being decoded? How successful do you think it is? I, I mean, um, like, I really have not that much idea on, on the application side, but it's still, I mean, uh, it really, for example, I mean, if somebody finds a super fast computer, okay, where you think that this is secure, then that system is, that means like it's really broken. I mean, so, you know, for example, uh, the, the Enigma in the second world war, it, it, it was assumed to be unbreakable. Like really, they thought that it's unbreakable, but it was done uh, with some certain tools by, by a machine, uh, simply Turing machine. It was, it was decoded by that machine. So it's, uh, I mean, um, it really depends on the time, but you know, I, we, we, I, from my perspective, I only check the mathematical side, but from the practical side, anything can happen at any time. I mean, you may think something completely secure, but somebody can get into it easily. I mean, I hope that answers kind of, uh, yeah. I think so. Thank you. Well, we are gonna wrap up our presentations today with Mr. Rodney Sheets. And this is a really special presentation. Not only um, is Rodney an active scientist with the USGS, but Rodney is also our current president for the Ohio Academy of Science. And so after Rodney's presentation um, today, he is going to give some final words and he and Mike Wojtek are going to wrap up and close us out um, this afternoon. So um, Rodney's presentation today is, and Rod, if you wanna transition to your screen, um, screen share, that would be great. I, have, I am actually screen sharing. Oh, sorry, I didn't even notice. I'm so sorry. Um, Rod's presentation today is Managing Water Resources Through Collaborative Research, a Career Perspective. So without further ado, I am going to give you Mr. Rodney Sheets. Angela, if you like the uh, idea of collaborative research, you're gonna love this talk because basically that's what this talk is about. Um, I work for the US Geological Survey Water Mission Area. Currently, I'm a technical support specialist, so I advise uh, other people across the country on their water, water projects, uh, mainly groundwater projects. And over the years, I've done a fair amount of research on my own and with other people. And what I wanna do is show um, six or seven projects that I've worked on over the years to uh, illustrate the, the, the width of collaboration that can happen. And um, so I'm, I'm gonna start this uh, talk off with a slide, um, a quote by John Bardeen, who mo many of you might know was a Nobel Prize winner, uh, actually not once, but twice. He won the Nobel Prize for inventing the transistor in 56 and then a theory of superconductivity in, in 72 and did both with a team of individuals. So that's why he was stressing that science is a collaborative effort. So I'm going to talk about uh, seven different projects going through sort of my career uh, that I worked on and I talk a little bit about the science, but mostly about the people I work with because that's the important part of what we do. So uh, this was a project clear back in 1990. That puts an age on me, I guess. Um, with the pro project was uh, initiated by uh, Dr. Scott Baer, who was my mentor, not my advisor in uh, graduate school, but my mentor. And he was working uh, on a site in South uh, Columbus, Ohio, the American Ag Quarry site, and he was being an ex expert witness for a legal battle that was going on there. And he read an article in the paper about uh, contaminant um, trucks carrying contamination were being rerouted around the center part of the city to the outer belt. 
He also knew that there was a, a well field just south of the outer belt, I-270, and that I, I, myself and Sandy were working on a project down at that well field. My particular project was uh, working uh, with a groundwater flow model. And so uh, Scott sent me the article. We started talking about it and realized that maybe the city might want to know how long it would take for a, a contamination plume to go from that uh, highway to the to the well field. So uh, it was an interesting collaboration. And one of the things I want to stress is that I collaborated with Scott from uh, the time I was in graduate school to uh, the time he retired just a few years ago. Uh, I also had to show uh, a, an article that was published in the Ohio Journal of Science uh, with uh, Bill Yost and uh, not, uh, he was a science educator, a high school science teacher in Gahanna Lincoln High School and retired and um, came to work for the USGS after, after school and was assigned to my project. And he was instrumental in this project, not really a classically trained hydrogeologist, but was very good on his feet and very good with talking to people. And so he was extremely critical in getting the permission of uh, a lot of homeowners where we had to measure uh, water levels in groundwater wells in the Silurian Devonian Carbonate Aquifer. And uh, this particular study was looking at the Mad River, uh, which is a river in Western Ohio, goes from um, north of Urbana down through uh, Dayton. And it has an extremely um, high amount of base flow, which is great for trout and fish. And uh, the temperature of that river stays about 55 degrees year long. And it um, doesn't go dry very, very, very often at all. And so we wanted to look into that a little bit when we're looking at the Silurian Devonian Carbonate. And we found that, in fact, the Silurian Devonian Carbonate leads to a lot of that base flow that's, that's going on in the river using geochemistry, using some physical measurements of stream flow and, and groundwater levels. This is another project that I was involved with in the mid 90s, mid to late 90s, where I worked with uh, Jens Monk, who is, uh, who at the time just finished his master's degree in electrical engineering of all things. And uh, decided after during this project that he wanted to go into geophysics. He was an intern for me uh, for, for two summers. And um, Jens and I were, uh, I was contacted by the Ohio Department of Transportation because of some previous work I had done in geophysics. And they had had a couple mine collapses in the state of Ohio and wanted to avoid any more mine collapses underneath highways. So we went to a couple projects. This particular picture is from a site in Jackson County, Ohio, where uh, in fact we found, uh, I don't know if you, can you see the cursor? No. Sorry. That's okay. Well, so I'll just, uh, where we found uh, with this resistivity method, we found a, a mine void under the road, actually a couple mine voids under the road. And so they excavated about a half a mile of this particular highway, Highway 32, um, coming out of w just outside of Wellston. We also did some work on Interstate 470 in um, Belmont County. But uh, Jens was, uh, we also used radar and, and as well as resistivity. And Jens' interest was, in fact, electromagnetic waves with radar. So he was extremely helpful. With us under, with me understanding radar was a new method for me. And Jens is now the chair of the electrical engineering department at the University of Anchorage, Alaska. And I still talk to him near, now and then. So another project I did about 10 years later with Scott Bear and a geochemist, a hard rock geochemist named Gary Rowe. And he was work, he started working with um, with us at the USGS in Columbus. And he was aware of some work that was being done with tritium and helium age dating in, uh, it was actually done out of Lamont Doherty labs. And um, Gary grabbed a hold of that technology and took a bunch of samples. And as he's taken these samples, he talked to me and uh, I happened to be working at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base at the time. Scott was working at mound, the mound plant, working on another groundwater flow model. 
and uh, we joined forces and he took these samples and we used those uh, results of those samples. It might have, I think the first or second uh, set of people that to, to take this tritium helium age dating and apply them to a model and make the model better by calibrating it to the age dates. And so this is a pretty common thing uh, done now with groundwater models. It's actually built into some groundwater mo mo flow modeling software. And then um, this is another project it did with a uh, civil engineer, Rob Darner, and uh, another hydrogeologist, more of a classically trained hydrogeologist. I'm more of a modeler, geophysics type person. And so Rob um, brought his civil engineering training and he's extremely good with, with electronics which is why I called him in on this project. This was a sort of an interesting project in that Bruce uh, was running the South or the Cincinnati well field. And they noticed water quality changes when they had flooding in the Great Miami River near the well field. And th the well field was put there specifically for what we call riverbank infiltration or riverbank filtration. And so it, it is there to get water indirectly out of the river. But when the river changes uh, stage, the gradients change, and when the when you have flooding in rivers, you also often have a slug of contaminants. So he wanted to know know more about the lag times of flow between the river and his wells. And so we designed this inclined well underneath the river, um, which was quite an engineering undertaking, which Rob was great at helping with. Notice in the picture there, we have a forklift holding the, um, the stem of the, of the uh, drill bit. And so we put these wells in to track that water. And Rob and I used statistics to look at specific inductance, chlorophyll, uh, all sorts of uh, parameters to determine. And specifically, we use temperature in this paper, but um, we, we could also use other things to to um, track that that slug of water and statistically at, uh, really no matter what gauge height we could tell how long it would take so that really helped the city understand uh, other people with riverbank filtration projects understand transport times from from rivers so that project led to an, a, a strange interaction i was given a talk at a riverbank filtration conference and uh, fell on the top ron harvey uh, came up to me after the talk, and um, he was working with uh, OSIS and pathogen transport in riverbank filtrations at a site that the, fell on the bottom. Jay Jaspers was running in California. Ron's out of uh, Boulder, Colorado. He works with Dave. They're both subsurface microbiologists, so really not that much knowledge of classical uh, moving water from rivers, but, he, but they were really looking at the transport of these oocysts and other pathogenic uh, bacteria, and, and even they're, they've moved into viruses uh, lately. Um, so Dave was more of a laboratory guy, and so we uh, provided them with some, after our conversation, I provided them with some sediment samples that we had saved from the site. He did a bunch of laboratory transport, and then uh, we were gonna do some transport from that inclined well into the to the well field, but the uh, for some reason the well field didn't want microspheres in their drinking water. So these microspheres are essentially the same size as uh, the the cryptos parvum uh, oocysts, and so they're really really tiny, and they can also come up manufacture these things in in pretty large quantities. So um, so at any rate, they Ron talked to me sometime later after we talked about the site and we collaborated pretty often for over a year. And then uh, he was asked to write a chapter for a book for what riverbed, riverbank filtration in, uh, in desert countries, which desert countries use riverbank filtration quite often. And so I, I was happily uh, involved with that project as well. And then one more, this is something we just did a couple years ago. Um, so uh, I did this work with Evelyn Roloffs and Dave Nelms. Dave and I were on a subsidence site in Eastern Virginia, um, sitting on a well actually. And we were talking uh, about setting up a, 
a network of wells to measure earthquakes, to monitor earthquakes. And so he had a well that responded quite well to earthquakes. And I knew there were other wells around. At the time, I was a regional water specialist. So I, I knew we focused on the Northeast region, uh, Eastern and Northeast region. And then we set this network up and it was pretty easy to do with existing data. And then uh, and lo and behold, an earthquake happens in Virginia, a pretty large earthquake. Some of you may have actually felt this in Ohio. The, the map there shows the, um, the, the blue and, and sort of red areas where the USGS has a network of seismometers. And, and this was actually crowd sourcing data where people would go on the internet and check in to say, yes, I felt it. And so you can see most of Eastern Ohio felt this particular earthquake. You can also see from the red and green dots that uh, there were many, many wells in our network, in our Eastern uh, US network that responded to the network. And Dave and I got together and looked at these responses and they, we just could not make sense of this stuff. So he, because of a previous project with Evelyn, uh, he knew this earthquake seismologist, Evelyn, and we called her in, we met her in Reston a couple times, and um, she came up with some strain models that uh, really sort of helped us understand this whole thing. So we, we got to publish a chapter in this special paper of the Geological Society of America paper. Um, paper. And uh, so in, in because of that, I'm working again with Rob Darner, the plot there at the bottom is actually not a seismogram. That is a well record from an earthquake that happened two weeks ago in, in Alaska. And that well record is from Van Wert County, Ohio. And so we're, what we're trying to do is deconvolute those data. Uh, we, the, the, the trouble is the seismograms collect data on a microsecond scale and most groundwater levels are collected on hourly or 15 minute scale. We have to collect the data at a really fast rate. And so Rob, again, the equipment civil engineer came up with this way to, to make these measurements and we're expanding that, that sort of network. And we're hoping to find earth properties from this, uh, these data. Anyway, Hopefully I didn't go too long. I uh, want to stress that collaboration helps me make your science better. And you can see from my work, I didn't constrain my collaboration to other people like me. And I encourage you not to either. I think um, Dr. Peoples mentioned this earlier. We, we learn about general science and engineering and, and things like that. You go to your, your specific area of science conferences, which is great, but also go to other conferences that are they're bigger, more widespread, so you can learn other things and get really unexpected perspectives, talk to people. And these collaborative relationships can last for, for decades. I, I still work with Scott Baer until a few years ago when he retired and still talk to him all the time. And it, it makes a difference for future researchers and, and local and regional communities. This type of work that we did was more about community type based research, but it, it can also apply to applied research. And what it makes a huge difference that you can affect policy. You can affect how policy gets made. And so politicians may not understand the science, but you make them understand what it means. And it, so the science doesn't end with the testing, uh, the high, with testing the hypothesis and the experiments that you do. As we heard today, all the people that that presented to students and the, the graduate students and, and the uh, researchers at Cincinnati. Um, we advertise our science by giving talks like this so we can let other people know what, uh, what sort of science we do and you publish. You publish this work in peer reviewed journals like the Ohio Journal of Science. The Ohio Journal of Science basically uh, jump started my career with publishing my information and there's the link to that. So. With that, I'll take any questions. There might be one or two. Okay. But I think it's interesting. I heard about the earthquake. Oh, I have one, hang on. But I heard about the earthquake. Um, they had said it was outside of Lima, but had no idea. What oh, no, no. So that earthquake was in Alaska oh. just, two, just two weeks ago. Yeah. 
we didn't we didn't have the network set up for the earthquake that happened a few years ago in Ohio. Okay. But that earthquake, uh, there was an earthquake in Alaska, a 6.3, I think. I don't remember exactly what it was. Um, and that, that earthquake propagated throughout the United States. I have it on, on our network. Wow. And nobody, nobody really felt it in the continental United States, but the ground feels it because of the physics. So I have some questions it's coming in now. Um, it says, geoscientists have predicted a 15% increase in the number of jobs available in the future. How can we better promote geosciences to K through 16? And as a teacher, I, I agree. They're not getting enough of it. How can you promote? Uh, well, you can get geoscientists to come and talk to your schools about the work that they do because it's sort of interesting and very broad ranging types of work, right? We do, I do mathematical modeling and geophysics. Scott does classical hydrogeology. Sandy does some modeling, some, some other types of different hydrogeologists do a whole bunch of different types of things. Different geologists do mapping of glacial, mapping of bedrock. It's a whole wide range and application of uh, math and physical science, biology, microbiology, geochemistry. So, um, I mean, really, it, it's 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 got a broad swath. And if there's going to be a 15% increase, you need to let your kids know that that is a broad, there's a broad number of things you can do with geoscience and, and civil engineering. Thank you. Um, a question, does your system pick up fracking that's occurring in Ohio? No. Um, so we do have some wells in Eastern Ohio where most of the fracking is going on. And uh, most of those wells in, in, in Pennsylvania, and, and upstate New York where a little bit of fracking is going on. We, uh, we think we see it now and then, but uh, we, don't, we aren't doing high frequency monitoring at every well. We're only doing high frequency monitoring at a, a very handful of wells. The Van Wert well is one. We also have a well in, um, in South Central Virginia that we're doing high frequency in one in Maine. But the only way you can pick up the fracking, the sort of low magnitude earthquakes, relative to the fracking is real high frequency um, seismometers and, and uh, water level recorders. You would probably never see more than point, uh, I'll, I'll say even in the best uh, response, well, uh, 0 0.05, 0 0.06 feet of water level change in your well. Now, the well in Virginia, for example, has uh, two to three feet of change both ways uh, to earthquakes in Indonesia, the, the magnitude nine. It, it had, we actually had somebody on site and we have a video of that water level coming up and down the well. Well, thank you, Rodney. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you and Mike to wrap it up for today. Sure, I only have a few things to say. Um, first of all, thanks to Angie, Erica, Charlie, Nick, and the uh, Academy staff, my Oitek and Doig Gruber, for putting this together. I think it's a great way to showcase the different science that's being done in Ohio for, it, and it's not just Ohio it's, uh, science for Ohio, it's science for, for the world. And uh, thanks, Dr. Peoples for, for starting this off. I think I, we did not even talk and I think we have a, a very similar message in that we want to, um, you want to as students nurture these collaborations and go to uh, your specific science, uh, join uh, academies that have journals that uh, apply to your specific science, but also be better rounded, be more rounded than just your particular science. Look at ways outside your science to help improve your science. And then I also want to thank all the presenters today. What a great job and what a what a nice showcase. Uh, really cool to hear the students, really cool to hear the the, the uh, college students and the and the professors from University of Cincinnati. I, 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 I was just enamored the whole day long. So thank you. Thank you all. And uh, Mike, 
I really can't add much more to that. Um, it was a great day. I, I really want to thank the committee for putting this together, all of the collaborators. Um, uh, Dr. Peoples, thank you again. Um, and yeah, I, I couldn't be more pleased with how the day turned out. So that's really all I have. Angie, thank I'll let you. Okay, I just want to say thank you to everyone. And um, for more information on how to get involved in science in Ohio, please visit the Ohio Academy of Science website and all of the programs that we offer. We're always looking for mentors and judges and just supporters of science for those that are actually going out there and doing hands-on science. So without further ado, thank you so much for attending today. And please don't be strangers and keep in touch and look for my podcast sponsored by the Ohio Academy of Science starting this fall called Because Science. Have a great day.